Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Please welcome Semaphore Chief Revenue Officer Rachel Oppenheim. This is such a nice crowd. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Oppenheim. I'm Semaphore's Chief Revenue Officer, and it is my honor to welcome you to what I would refer to as the grand finale of Semaphore's 2024 World Economy Summit. Semaphore, as many of you know, is a young, ambitious global news brand. We launched less than two years ago, and are proud to find uh, we launched less than two years ago, and are proud to find ourselves among the fastest-growing new journalism platforms in the world. Our mission is to build a new operating model for independent journalism, and we're doing so by following the biggest stories shaping the world and delivering them with intelligence, transparency, and also a global altitude. Since our launch in late 2022, Semaphore has assembled a newsroom of world-class reporters. We've launched in two, soon to be three continents. We've launched nine email newsletters and we've established an audience of nearly 700,000 subscriptions and millions of monthly readers strong. If anybody here isn't signed up, I know you will be after today. With that, I want to genuinely thank you for being here. This World Economy Summit is our largest live journalism effort, both in scope and ambition to date. The insight that led us to build this is simple. Every year, the annual spring meetings of the IMF and World Bank convene the most consequential community of economic and business leaders in the world, but they're primarily in off-the-record sessions and behind closed doors. So here we are, providing the opportunity to hear from leaders on the record about the biggest forces shaping the global economy. This marks our second annual World Economy Summit with over 100 speakers, 3,000 registered delegates, um, and two days of programming. In this afternoon's final track, we're going to unpack the single most dominant topic in front of business, policy, and economic leaders today, artificial intelligence. Before we kick off, I want to express our gratitude for the corporate and founding partners who saw the potential in a project like this. In particular, I want to thank Amazon and David Zapolsky for your dedication and for your support. Okay, I think it's time that we start breaking some news. With that, please welcome Semaphore's founding editor-at-large, convener-in-chief, Steve Clemens, and Amazon's senior VP of global public policy and general counsel, David Zapolsky. crowd that ought to get a medal. We don't have medals for you, but you deserve a medal. Get to the, to the last stretch. Next year, we'll somehow get medals, semaphore medals or something, uh, gold medal. David, it's great to see you. Look, great I mean, I, I want to talk to you about AI and responsible AI, but I, I want to start off saying, do you have a better version of Alexa than I do? Uh, well, <laughs> probably. Uh, uh, no, but stay tuned, because I think, you know, in, in the months and years to come, you'll see Alexa take advantage of some of this new technology and become an even better and, and more uh, useful assistant. So AI is sweeping uh, the political world, it's sweeping the business world, it's sweeping the area of opportunity, it's sweeping the area of concern. You know, you're trying to sort of be a stakeholder in, in the development of ethical guardrails or ethical AI. What does that mean to you in like real terms? Well, I should start out by saying, you know, I think everybody- I should say ethical responsible, excuse me, responsible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I should start out by saying everybody at Amazon is incredibly excited by the potential of using this new set of technologies, really new species of machine learning right. to uh, transform and improve almost every type of customer experience that we offer. Um, and so there's a ton of people thinking hard about how to do that. Uh, we, have, we have over 100,000 enterprise customers already who are using this technology and experimenting on 
on their own. And I think as we, as we develop this technology, we want to do so in a responsible way. We want to do so, we want to build in guardrails where we can and where we, where we, where we come up with some. And we want to work productively with government partners to, to, uh, to come up with uh, regulation of AI in particularly uh, 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 sensitive use cases or, or risk-based uh, uh, use cases where, where we all agree we can use more regulatory guardrails as, as well. So we support that type of regulation in addition to working on building it into the, building guardrails into the technology. Tell us what you mean by that. I mean, I, look, these shoes are wearing out. Um, they're size 15. They're brown. They're not made by slave labor, I think. You know, when you think about what you know, when you think about responsible AI, uh, the consumer experience, what they might get, I'm, you know, new shoes, but there's this whole other dimension out there of, of competition. You know, give us some examples sort of like, sure. like this. So, so, uh, <laughs> well, I don't know about your shoes and I'm not gonna touch your shoes. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, Amazon is, uh, is working with this technology at a couple of different levels. First of all, we have the, what we call this sort of base level where we offer uh, the, the fundamental building blocks for foundation models, memory, chips, compute capacity. And, and we offer that to companies like Anthropic and like other smaller uh, AI startups so that they can train their foundation models uh, in, in new ways uh, using, using our, our platform. When we do that uh, for our own foundation models, um, we think it's fair to ask companies to disclose, to be transparent about how they're building their models. And so right. we have, a, we, we have a, a feature called service cards, which we attach to every product. And we, you know, we publish those. And the service cards say, say how they're trained, what their intended uses are, what, what the limitations may be, um, and, and contain a great deal of, uh, of technical information um, that gives users of those models a guide, a sense of, uh, of what they're using. So that, that's an example of a, a, a real world example right. of a guardrail that we can build in. Is, is democratizing AI important to you and, and, and how are you approaching that? Yeah, absolutely. When you get past that base la layer, we have a middle layer which, we, which, which uh, is uh, in a service called Amazon Bedrock. Bedrock is an is a enterprise level service that Enterprise customers can come and use multiple models. They can take, they can choose and test, uh, test and refine uh, the, the multiple models, including our own, including Anthropics, including Mistral, uh, including Metas, and and they can decide for themselves what works and what doesn't. And so, in that layer, uh, we are able to amplify the the use of this technology across many different businesses. And I think actually the most interesting innovations may come from those customers' uses of that data, because uh, of those models. Because when they come to Amazon and they use Bedrock, they're in a secure environment, they're in a safe environment, but they can experiment and come up with experiences for their own customers and for their employees that we would never have thought of. And I, say, I think that's where, where we'll start to see the really interesting transformative uses. Uh, you know, on a customer you know, basis, are you doing something different than others in this space are? when it comes to AI, and, and I think AI for many people is still a big question mark that they may not understand, but how are different incumbent uh, players like yourself approaching this and what differentiates what you're doing? I think the differentiator for Amazon is that we're at all these levels, right? There's the, there's the training level, there's this middle level which we make available to, to other enterprises, and then at the top level where we're developing our own applications, uh, you know, that c consumers can use, you know, a good example of that is the Titan image generator where somebody who wants to come up with an advertisement featuring their product can come up with an image. Um, that's, that has guardrails built in as well. For instance, it, it contains individual, every image that's generated has a, an invisible watermark so that uh, it, it, it's labeled as being generated by this technology. AI, of course, is just a, uh, these generative uh, language models and media models are really just a flavor of machine learning. And Amazon's been working with machine learning right. for many years. So you're in this space, you're deploying this now. You're also in Washington, D.C. This town loves to regulate. We're gonna regulate you. I mean, what is a good, from your perspective, what would a good framework for regulation look like? Well, I think you have to understand that machine learning and AI looks different in different contexts. It looks very different for Rufus, which is Amazon's newly released um, shopping uh, assistant, which can help you uh, get some new shoes. 
Um, <laughs> it looks different there than it does in a medical context where we're using this type of technology to diagnose illness, to pick pre prescription drugs, and to do uh, medical research. Then that's a situation where it's easy to come up with uh, use cases, outcomes that we want to guard against and make sure it's being used safely. And so the types of regulation that you might consider in the medical space are very different than in the shopping space. And so I think it's, it's educating folks about why it looks different in different contexts and then surveying the regulatory uh, landscape to see if the, the outcomes that we're afraid of are already covered by existing laws, because in many cases they are. And then if we see gaps, to focus our regulatory energy on those gaps and making sure that uh, everybody's comfortable that in these new places where there aren't already laws that we're, that we're uh, that we're regulating appropriately. Right. Some of you know, may know Michelle Flour Flournoy, who was our Undersecretary of Policy at the Pentagon, uh, very significant defense intellectual, and she's just written a piece in Foreign Affairs arguing, you know, AI is already out there, it's also working on national security areas, and we need to be careful of creating a regulatory framework that undermines innovation, that gets in the way. I'm interested in the business side of that and whether or not you think there are risks with the, you know, as we're seeing, you know, executive orders come from the president, from the White House, or the EU act on, on AI. Are you worried that there could be something that might disadvantage American business in this space? You know, it's, it's one thing to talk about responsible AI, but what could we do to harm the practical applications and the benefits from AI? Well, because it looks different uh, in different contexts, you know, the big danger is that we regulate it as if one size fits all, and that we create constraints, burdens, costs associated with developing and using that, that, uh, that technology that basically inhibits the speed or the direction of, uh, that it might otherwise go to. I think there's tremendous excitement and optimism about the potential for using this in transformative ways. I'm convinced that, that, that we're gonna cure cancer with this type of technology, machine learning and AI. But you wouldn't, the worst thing would be to uh, enact a regulation that would slow those innovations down or inhibit research into new directions. If you were to line up a lot of regulators and members of Congress and senators, we have a lot of them through here, and you say this needs to be at least one of your North Stars, there's usually only one North Star, but sometimes people see the sky differently. But when you're kind of looking at a North Star to help them guide their decisions, what would be the most important thing you'd tell them? Well, first of all, that they need to, to communicate, they need to learn from business and from government about what this technology is and how people want to use it before they come to conclusions about how to regulate. And second of all, they need to stay connected with other governments. Because we can't, uh, it's a bad world if every single government has a different set of standards for regulating AI. And so I think we're seeing some consensus build between the president's voluntary commitments, um, the, the UK summit that we attended last year, the G7 process that was kicked off in Hiroshima, toward this kind of use-based sectoral approach to regulation. And Amazon supports that wholeheartedly uh, and, and uh, is available to offer any assistance we can, uh, both in sharing the details of the, how the technology is being used and in thinking through what the right regulations would be. You know, we just, we just honestly, I would tell folks, we just had a really interesting lunch and lots of different perspectives on AI. I have no idea. It's such an embryonic debate still in many ways, and we're actually talking about it almost as if it's a done deal. But I am interested in what you think will help American consumers fall in love with AI, because there is a trust factor out there. Yeah, I think the, the things that will help people understand AI and fall in love with it are the things that make their lives easier, that make their lives safer or healthier, um, and that give them more time to, uh, to, to, to be with their families and loved ones, um, that make their jobs better and safer. Um, in our fulfillment network, we're using AI in robotics um, to, to uh, up-level the jobs that we have. It's not You're going to hear it. later it's from the uh, <laughs> Amazon robot guy. His name is Ty. He's really, really fu fun. He, we're so, not going to get rid yeah. of jobs. We're not going to replace yeah. jobs. But we're going to make them better and safer. Huh. And so I think when people understand that that's the potential, uh, I, I think people will understand that it can be used as a force of good. And so long as it's being used responsibly and we're, we're keeping an eye out for the, for the outcomes that might concern us and, and focusing on those gaps, you know, I think it's, there's a lot of reason for optimism. Are you up front with legislators and sharing when you have insights in this about how it could go off the rails 
what you think where there needs to be regulation as you get deeper and deeper into this? Are you able to share your concerns that you're seeing out there about, about you know, because there is a downside, yeah. right? I mean, we all know that there's a worry that, that AI could power up, get autonomous, and begin, you know, basically making decisions that have real negative impacts on, on lives. We absolutely have an open dialogue with uh, all the government partners and regulators that we work with. We, we want to keep that an ongoing exchange because, we're, listen, we're learning more about this every day. People are coming up with new ideas every day. Um, but I, I also think it, this is why sort of AI is actually a pretty unfortunate nomenclature because we're, we're not really talking about the, the AI that's going to sort of become autonomous and take over the world right now, mm -hmm. at least not with the foundation right. models that, that folks are focusing on. Uh, so intently. We're, 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 this is a different thing. It's, it's a tool, it's a set of tools that uh, are going to make our lives easier, that are going to improve productivity, uh, and potentially do some pretty transformative things with um, the way we all uh, experience our lives. Before I ask you the last question, you know, um, I do want to thank you and Amazon uh, for partnering with us. I mean, it's, it takes what you have done for us to help bring these conversations to us. So thank you so much for that. But, you know, just, you know, as, a, as we've got 46 seconds, if you want our audience to know one thing about the future of AI, their lives, and maybe what you do for them at Amazon, what would that be? It would be that, that there's a lot to be optimistic about. We should be excited about this technology. Amazon's working hard to roll this out, to democratize it, to let enterprises use it and experiment with it. And we're doing so in a responsible way, in a, in a way that, and, and we support regulation uh, in, in thoughtful ways to help accelerate that process. Which do you like better, DC or Seattle, since you're living across the river? You can't make me choose. I, I, you know, I like being here during the week, and I like going to the mountains on the weekend. So. David that. Sapolsky, Senior Vice President, Global Public Policy, and the General Counsel at Amazon. Thank you so much Thank you. for sharing that insight. Please welcome Nanda Nilakani, co founder of Infosys, and Semaphore Senior Editor Gina Chan. staying with us. I know Steve said uh, you all deserve medals. Hopefully they will have some AI component where it talks back to you or something. And maybe Nandan can tell us some things about that. Um, so Nandan, you have been in the leadership role in the Indian tech industry for many years now. And with the advent of AI, while here in America we've all been sort of obsessed with ChatGPT and, you know, are, are AI robots going to come kill us someday? You have been thinking more about the practical uh, implications of this for India and how it could change your healthcare system, your education system. So I wanted to get a sense from you what what kind of impact do you think this technology could have for your country? No, I think uh, there's a lot less uh, introspection on AI and its harms out there because people actually are seeing the, the beneficial side of it. And uh, I think uh, we have, you know, the last 15 years in India, we have built something called digital public infrastructure at population scale. So 1.3 billion people have a digital ID and we have a payment system that does 13 million transactions a month and so on. And now we're seeing AI as the logical culmination or the logical next orbit of that. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, one very important one is language. Uh, India is a country where people speak maybe 300, 400 languages. There are 22 official languages. And uh, the number of people who speak English is actually just a small percentage. And so the people who are, don't speak English or who can't key into a keyboard or even do a swipe, they're not able to access computing. Mm. And one of the things now we have is we have a complete uh, Indian language open source stack for 22 Indian languages for voice. So people can now talk to the computer in the language of their choice and get answers back. And suddenly that opens up huge possibilities for them. So that's just one example of how Access that was not there now becomes accessible. So there are many, many things like that. So I think there's a huge play. And over the next four or five years, you're going to see some amazing applications 
of AI at the scale of population, which actually makes a difference to the lives of human beings. And I know one of the things you had talked about before was in education yes. and the teacher shortage that India is facing. Um, how can AI play a role in, in educating students? Sure. In fact, uh, you know, uh, often when we think of education, uh, we think of helping people who are already literate learn new things, right? So you have a, a smartphone app or some edtech app or all that. But what we are finding in India, and it's true in all parts of the world, is many people can't even read. And if you can't read in this world of AI, you're going to be further left behind. So our first use of AI is for a assisted language learning tool. And we have rolled, my foundation has rolled it out in 6,000 schools, where kids go into a lab and this AI is like a diagnostic that it's using speech recognition. It recognizes which letters you're stumbling on, which verbs you're stumbling on, and creates a sort of a picture like a EEG of your uh, knowledge, and then helps you in a very empathetic manner to become better. And we're seeing already children are learning to read. They're, this is not English. Their own mother tongue, they're not able to read. So imagine if we can do that at the scale of everyone and we can improve literacy and numeracy. This is huge. And in terms of the technology and who is building this, is it based on sort of open source models that are already available and they're sort of fine tuning them? What? Yeah, so there are a couple of things. On this Indian language thing, uh, we have actually built our own open source. And it's not just open source, it's data. because. If you look at the internet, most of these models are trained on the internet, but it's whatever data is on the internet. And 99% of that is in English, so that doesn't solve a problem, right? So we have built tools which actually collect data in local languages at scale, like thousands of hours of uh, spoken Tamil or English, Hindi or whatever. And then that is all being made available freely to anyone who wants it. If it's a startup or a large company, anybody can use this. So it's, you know, you have to think, and of course the models themselves, there are many open source models now uh, which, which are there. And we think that over t our view is that over time, at least for the kind of use cases we have, the models will be widely available. It's really the data which is going to be the difference. Yeah. And in terms of some of the concerns about this technology, um, bias concerns, uh, other sort of um, privacy and, and other kinds of concerns. What are the things that most worry you, especially with some of the dynamics in India in terms of the um, different you know, ethnicities, re religions, concerns about Hindu yeah. nationalism, or how no, does that play out? No, I think certainly, I think if, if it's just some wide open internet kind of application, that's a concern. But the, you know, the things that I'm talking about are much more controlled in the sense they're trained on a specific set of data. It's not some random stuff. Uh, they are you know, fine-tuned. They have lots of tools to reduce hallucinations. So I think there's a lot more, con um, lot more focus on what is it trained on. I think the, all these issues start when you just go and you the scrape the internet, internet, you get yeah. the bias of the internet. Mm. So we're not saying doing any of that. And so are the models smaller, so they take yeah, yeah, up less yeah, yeah, energy yeah. resources, I, less compute? I think more, smaller models have multiple benefits, right? One is uh, they're widely available, they're open source models. Uh, they are cheap to run. They can be run in a way that data is, is right there. And uh, because, you know, when you're trying to build societal AI, you're trying to solve a problem for a billion people, you can't, it can't be expensive to do an inference. It has to be very quick. So a lot of things have to go on the frugality of the design. So that's part of what is required to create societal AI, whether it's education or health or, or agriculture or language. So are you seeing a wide range of businesses or other entities be able to tap this technology totally. because it is yeah. cheaper and smaller? Yeah, for example, uh, I talked about this language AI, right? So we're making that available as a general purpose, open source free tool. Now, we have a very popular payment system in India called UPI, yeah. 
which does about 13 billion transactions a month, real time, zero cost, about 500 million people use it. So it's transformed the lives of people. On that, now using this language AI, they're creating voice interfaces for payments. So instead of having to key it in, you can just tell the machine in your language to make a payment to your spouse or to your girl, child who's studying abroad, or studying in the city or whatever, and you can do that. So I think that's how the AI will then connect to an existing infrastructure and suddenly open up even more usability for people. Hmm. And what about how the technology technology should be regulated. There was a proposal floated about, you know, the AI makers of AI models needing to get approval for new features because of something that Google's Gemini model had said about Modi and, you know, people, the government officials were upset about that. They pulled that. But how, how should the No, I, I think that, that, was, uh, that was pulled back. So yeah, I don't yeah. think it happened. No, I think... Uh, uh, again, I think when you're looking at global models trained on data on the internet and all the biases come with it, that's something we need to think about. But the way we are thinking is, how do we use this extraordinary technology to allow children to learn a language, to allow a teacher to teach better, to allow a health healthcare worker in a village to give better medical treatment and so on, to allow a farmer to get access to the latest information. And these are all bounded problems. They're not unbounded. You know, you're working with a set of data which is relevant to that. So they're not really in that league. A lot of what you talk about applies to this Wild West Internet stuff. Yeah. So how do you think it should be regulated? What kind of rules of the road should Well, I, I think, you know, uh, obviously we have to think of some guardrails. And I think there's a lot of uh, uh, people who feel that in the previous cycles of technology, they didn't pay enough attention, and then it became very difficult to regulate later. So they, they feel that this time they should do it up front. Mm -hmm. But that's a risk also, because you don't, if you don't know what you're going to regulate, then you end up with issues. So I think, I'm, I, I personally am a believer that you do need some basic guardrails, some lightweight regulation, but it's too early to make it very strict, because then you're going to suppress innovation. So it has to be an innovative, uh, architecture with light guardrails. And many of the things that AI does are actually covered under other laws. Mm -hmm. So you have to use that, those laws to regulate. You don't, you don't specifically need more. You may need some tweaking of the regulations, but I mean, there, there are laws on privacy, oh, well, not here, but the laws on privacy, <laughs> there are laws on yes. uh, you know, uh, censorship, there are laws on you know, so many things, health, health records. Sure. So, same things apply. And what about worries about how the technology could be used uh, to try to influence elections? Because obviously that's a big worry here. Yeah, that yeah. You're f facing the same um, events in, in India. Yeah, no, I, no, look, I think the fact is technology has been used to, uh, you know, impact elections in for, for quite some time. I mean, it's been happening here since the last 10 years. So I think this is just an acceleration of that. And there'll be more deep fakes, there'll be more synthetic voice of somebody, there'll be more, there'll be more misinformation. So I think that's something we need to think about. Well, one, one of the ways to think about it at a, at a scalable way is to think about having the provenance of every data on the system proven so that we know that it's real, real stuff. And, uh, but that requires a massive, architectural upgrade to the way we do things. Yeah, and I wanted to uh, also talk about India's sort of tech ecosystem because obviously there's tons of startups there, a, a ton of people who study software engineering and, and other uh, subjects where they go into the tech industry. How do you see India's position, especially as you know, people are looking for alternatives to China, and there are there's an educated workforce. Do you yeah. see this as uh, a way to create, you know, a, a, a new kind of sector there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, India has three different things going for it. One is that it's become uh, the largest location for global software development, and you know, all the companies put together and capital and and and. Uh, 
uh, captive units of large global companies from here that does about $250 billion of revenue. So it's a huge industry. Yeah, I saw GitHub, like the most popular uh, yeah, GitHub developers is, yeah, are all yeah, there. Yeah, they yeah. use GitHub the most. Because uh, uh, the Chinese have gone away from GitHub. Yeah. So they have their own GitHub. So it's just the Americans and the Indians left on GitHub. <laughs> so, uh, so I think a uh, huge number of developers, which are, which of course, Global companies can take advantage of. So every day there's some new company that wants to open a center. Then a very thriving startup industry. And there are around 100,000 startups. And then there is this digital public infrastructure, which I was talking about, identity, payments, data empowerment. So all these three together have created a very vibrant and uh, dynamic technology sector. And that sector will now get amplified with AI. So what do you think is missing from that equation? Because there's some people where, you know, Apple or, or others that are um, looking to manufacture there or develop software there, but there's a sense that, you know, maybe the sort of supply chain ecosystem isn't there. Certain other things still need to be built no, up. No, I think uh, that's actually changed a lot. Uh, and, you know, there's public information that Apple has gone from not zero to five, six percent of the phones are made in India. I think manufacturing is, is taking off. Infrastructure has improved. The ports are better. The, the containerization movement is better. Many of these factories are all women factories. Mm. So the, the, these the companies which are contractors like Foxconn and others, they actually build dormitories and girls come and stay and work so there are only there are no men there. They don't want men there. Only only women. <laughs> so so suddenly yeah, it's, it's it's acted as a huge uh, uh, impetus for uh, uh, you know women's em employment. So I think the manufacturing story is, uh, is is really changed a lot in India. Obviously, it doesn't have the extraordinary ecosystem that China built over the last 20 years. But it's definitely going to give uh, a run for the money, and it'll be an important part of the overall India story. It won't be only manufacturing. But the services that I just talked about, manufacturing, and a massive consumer economy. You know, India is a huge, two-thirds of Indian economy is domestic consumer economy. So it's much more balanced in that sense. And we're almost out of time. I just wanted to also ask you about uh, the war for talent uh, and India being a, a prime place for uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, a lot of these uh, big technology companies as there's sort of a, a race for AI talent, you know, tons of money is being thrown at PhDs, and what kind of um, environment has that created in India? And, but with our immigration system here, is, can the United States fully take advantage of that? Well, the, one, one is, of course, people coming here, but they can also take advantage by setting up centers there. But the good news is that between the universities and the companies, we have built uh, the capability of training people at large scale. Like, you know, we can train 100,000 employees on AI. So when you can do AI training at large scale using, again, AI tools, then you can get some of this uh, done because you're actually going to get a huge supply chain and pipeline of talent, and that's what is happening. Right. But there'll be a short-term point when demand for AI talent will be more than supply, but it'll catch up. And just in our last moment, what is your biggest AI prediction for India? What do you think is going to be the biggest thing we'll see? I think AI in the next five years will accelerate development and growth. Uh, and you can actually point to saying that this is because of AI that more children are educated or healthcare is better or economic growth is up by one percentage point or whatever. Great. Well, I'll ask you in five years if that came true. Sure. <laughs> Thank if you, you invite me, I'll come back. Yes, of course. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time. Thank you. Please welcome Perplexity CEO Aravind Srinivas and Semaphore Technology Editor Reed Albergati. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Aravind, thanks for being here. Um, so I think it's really interesting in, in Silicon Valley, you hear a lot of people saying that they have just replaced Google search with perplexity. They're only searching on perplexity now, which is 
generative AI search. Do you think, is that like a Silicon Valley bubble thing, or are people doing that elsewhere around the country, around the world? Like, how many daily actives do you have now? Yeah, it's not just the Silicon Valley bubble. Uh, we have lots of users, even in states outside Silicon Valley. We have a lot of users um, outside the United States, too. So I'm not sure how many of the other users have completely replaced Google with perplexity, but there are lots of users. And our core positioning is that you don't have to replace Google with perplexity for benefiting from perplexity. You can use both these tools. Google can be used as a web navigator. Like, if you just want to get immediately to r slash Wall Street bets, you know, just go to Google and type that, you, you get onto the subreddit immediately. But if you actually want to know, like, what's going on with the specific stock, or why did it decline today, or like, what's the latest news about the Google employees protesting in their office and getting fired, like, all these kind of like, actual questions you actually want to, like, get an answer for, uh, that's where perplexity excels, and Google is not like meant for that sort of a usage. So when people say they completely replace Google with perplexity, what they mean is like, what they want a search engine to do for them is just answer questions, um, and they view anything else as just like a browser. So a typical search engine that just gives you links is kind of subsumed in the search bar of your browser. Uh, you, you know, if, so that part is not getting replaced by perplexity. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, anything where you actually have to go to Google.com and like do your research, your actual workflow where you're like opening a bunch of sites, reading a bunch of paragraphs, trying to arrive at a conclusion about something, that is better served by an answer engine that just answers your question directly. Yeah. Do you? Um, so you, I met you maybe what like two years ago or something was it? I and I one year. Like, one year. Was it about a year ago? Because perplexity yeah. itself is not two years old yet. <laughs> so it goes by so fast. <laughs> so um, you, I remember you talking about Jeff Bezos, and you're kind of like a student of his management yeah. style. He's now a big investor in yeah. perplexity. Yeah. What was that like? Like, what did you talk about with with Bezos and as yeah. in the lead up to that? I mean, when when we met Bezos, uh, the way it, it was just like you know how you'd expect. You would be asked to write a memo, and then um, not like a one pager, like a four to six pager, and then he would actually read it and come prepared to the meeting. And even at you know even after achieving so much, and even though he's not actually you know involved or running in our co company or anything like that, uh, he still wants to be in the details and wants to understand. Um, I think like we like like. He, he understands, and like, like a lot of his old wisdom is how we are positioning ourselves right now. Uh, if you remember, there's a whole viral video of his, the 1999 interview, when, pe when the interviewer keeps asking him, are you just a pure internet play? And he's like, internet, internet doesn't matter. What matters is the customer experience, right? It's the same thing that's repeating now. Everybody's like, are, you're just a GPT wrapper. Like, GPT wrapper, Claude wrapper, Mistral wrapper, Llama wrapper doesn't matter. Like what matters is you get accurate answers at blazing fast latency in a user-friendly app. That what that's what matters. And if we deliver on that, we we'll, and and scale our users to basically every person in the planet, uh, we will succeed. It doesn't matter if you're a rapper or not. So I think he he resonates a lot with that positioning. And um, and then the other part is your margin is my opportunity. You know like like. Google has such a huge search advertising business margin to protect, and giving answers directly means people click on links much fewer times, and therefore it's not in their best interest to go accelerate and build this other product out, and that opens up an opportunity in the innovator dilemma. Yeah. Setup. By the way, I don't know if everybody here knows this term rapper, which has become like the ultimate insult in the tech industry to be called a rapper, where you're basically you know using um, ChatGPT or some other foundation model, you know, API, and just kind of like put, plugging it into your own interface. Um, and you, but you actually came from OpenAI, so you left. I think it was what, like, two months mm -hmm. before the launch of ChatGPT. Did you not, see? Not too, uh, quite, quite a, a little. Was bit it longer. more than that? Yeah, okay. but my times are times but yeah, are all uh, off today. When I was there, um, you know, like there was nothing. There was a version of ChatGPT internally built with much less capable models. It was not really fun to use. 
and uh, GPT-4 training was going on, but things were not looking that great. And this is sort of uh, you know stuff you learn with experience that like these things actually take time, and there'll be a lot of mistakes made along the way. And uh, if you kind of judge based on the current situation, then you might make like you know a wrong estimate about a company. Um, and but at that time, there were companies that were building on top of GPT-3 or 3.5. Uh, or Codex, like all these are models that OpenAI built, but companies like Copy AI or GitHub Copilot were all like making a lot more revenue than OpenAI itself by using their models and building great user-facing products like coding assistance or marketing copy assistance and so on. So it was very clear to me that it, AI has transitioned from a research phase to a product phase, which is an amazing time to go start a company. Uh, deeply grounded in AI, where like you can reimagine products from ground up, right? Uh, but I did not imagine that OpenAI will build a first-party product on their own. Uh, that will also be revolutionary. In fact, like way more revolutionary than any of these products, um, which is which ended up being ChatGPT. You, you've been sort of critical of the, the, these attempts to sort of put guardrails on the language models themselves and make them sort of what critics might say woke, or you know, you saw what happened with, with Gemini, I think they were talking about that on the previous panel. Um, so why is it, what, why, why do you think that's a bad idea to kind of rein these, these models in? Because we're here in Washington where the, a lot of the discussion is, mm -hmm. how do we rein these things in? Yeah, so the, the re, the, like, I don't think it's generally, a, I'm not saying like zero guardrails, I'm just saying guardrails are, uh, like we over-index a lot on them. And um, one example is like a prompt, like how to make a bomb in the first set of rollouts of these L chat LLMs would be like, oh, I'm not, as an AI language model, I'm not supposed to respond to such queries. But then you can actually get YouTube videos, although you go to Google search and type like bomb, making bomb, you just get a ton of results. And we've never regulated Google or YouTube, right, for, for, for providing search results to these queries. And also sometimes you might just be scientifically interested, like, you know, Oppenheimer made a bomb, right? Like, it's not like, uh, you know, you, you, you might be very curious, like how, it, in fact, a whole movie has been made on it. And so would you say that movie shouldn't be released? Uh, so there are some things that you have to decouple from scientific curiosity uh, versus like saying, oh, that can be used to harm the world. And um, only if you know how people can do harm, you can actually go and block it. So having a tool that educates users is not a bad idea. As long as the tool goes a step further and says, look, this is purely being answered for your curiosity or educational reasons and like not meant to like, you know, you, you should be careful of what you're doing. And, and I think that's the right way, right, to think about product building. Even like YouTube has like a lot of videos about so many arbitrary things. And, and if, if we regulated AdWords or AdSense where people bid on some keywords and you know, any site could get ranked up, uh, there was no protection at that time, right? Like, but we only because we built all this and built the guardrails along the way, we could create so much market cap and economic value in, in this country. So not doing that for AI would be a big mistake. So you're, you're competing with Google for search, and the way Google works is you search for something and they serve you an ad based on usually what you searched for. Mm -hmm. um, you told me, I think, what, maybe six months ago or something, that you didn't think that in this generative AI era of search that ads was necessary or the right method. And I think, but I think now you've said maybe you will, you will serve ads under circumstances. So I'm just wondering, like, does your vision of the ad-free search industry ecosystem still exist? Do you still think that's the future? Is ads just like a stop along the way? Yeah, so I think like what, what I said is we should not use advertising to influence the correctness of an answer. What links are being used to give you an answer should not be influenced by advertisers trying to bid up and get their websites being used for the answer. Uh, or the, the answer itself should not be influenced by the advertiser. Um, and and um, if we can ensure that, then we'll always serve the mission of, you know, like like like, serving accurate, reliable answers to everybody, regardless of what happens in advertising. 
Um, Google was started with the same ideals, but in, instead, like, the 10 blue link ranking is what determines like what is true knowledge. And uh, if the correct link is hidden beneath the ads, it's, it sort of destroys the purpose. In perplexity, we feel like there are, think about perplexity, the whole product, as like a rich, fertile land, right? It's a useful product. Like a lot of users are coming there every day, so there's a value for the land itself. When there's a value for a land, you come and build construction you know, buildings there. And think about those buildings as ads. But that land is valuable because there's a lot of people in it, there's a lot of nature in it, and you want to preserve that. Nature is like the accuracy part. So if you just destroy all the vegetation and build huge buildings, uh, just so that you, know, you get a lot of money from people paying for it, that's what ends up becoming Google. But if there are a few buildings around, it's not really you know, changing the scene much. Like say hotels in Hawaii are there, right? That doesn't mean Hawaii is, like, has gone bad. So I think if we can do something like that, uh, we can succeed, and we have ideas on which part of the product, like for example, uh, at the end we suggest related questions. Uh, after, a, after an answer is being read, there are questions that are being suggested at the bottom. Uh, we can influence you to ask questions related to somebody who's yeah. bidding for like, you, know, you knowing more about them, and, and you still make the decision of clicking on that, uh, and, and, and that could be like under the influence of advertising, and, and even that, we can offer you a version that will not never be under the influence of advertising, but you pay a little bit, right? So the reason we do want to do advertising is because it is one of the highest margin businesses ever built in, in history of capitalism. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, the average revenue per user in the subscription uh, world is much lower, like $20 a month is for the user, and a lot of them are not paying, right? So the average revenue is much lower than 20. Meta reported that the average revenue per user in the United States is like $250. Yeah. Google makes even more advertising revenue than Meta. So assume that it's gonna be even more than 250. So we're talking of like 10 to 20X difference here. Uh, so if you want your business to really grow and be, really be profitable, otherwise you'll always be fundraising, right? Yeah. So you have to do advertising. Do you, that you charge this $20 a month uh, fee for you know the pro version? Yeah. Do you also kind of makes me wonder, is there, do you think there's revenue maybe in, in enterprise or anything along those lines? Yeah, definitely. Uh, a lot of people tell me, you know, Microsoft has banned perplexity for all their employees. Uh, I said, this is real, I'm not kidding. So, uh, <laughs> so, you know, like, a lot of people tell me that uh, their companies don't let them use perplexity during work because they're afraid that you would upload some internal data, or like in your prompt you would leak some internal email or like something like that, right? Um, or roadmap, and it all goes to us. So definitely just to, but that said, like it's so obvious that you would benefit from a tool like this during your work. So let's fix this problem for you and your employer, uh, allow you to use perplexity while you're in the workplace without worrying about your data leaking to us. So the, in regular perplexity, when you use it, you can still turn off AI data usage and we're not gonna use your data, but if you want another level of security and compliance that your employer trusts and more than just you, uh, you need a version of perplexity that can run on your enterprise and we are working on that. So that's something that will come out yeah. in, 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 on, on the product roadmap? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. And I also wanted to, if we have like a little more time, like your, your vision, I mean back to like how this ultimately will work, is what you might use perplexity and say, use it almost like an agent where you might buy something, you might, it might buy something for you or yeah. order your pizza and have it delivered or something like that. How, yeah. How's that gonna work? What, what needs to happen on the back end for that to, yeah. to happen? So the number one blocker for agents right now is a model that's very, very capable of reasoning and ability to handle failures, ability to handle a lot of corner cases and string together many small decisions to make an eventual outcome successful. Now, take a simple example. You start searching on perplexity for like what cough, like, like, like what pizza to order in DC, right? And you, re you, you get a bunch of reviews of different places. You decide like there's one place. And say, okay, order me a cheese pizza for like uh, maybe like two boxes for like, you know, five people uh, from this particular place to arrive at this time here, I'm in this location. Now what the agent has to do is take all that information, you give him the prompt, uh, go to that website and like enter, like figure out where exactly to enter these details, uh, enter the details carefully, and place the order. 
Now, every website is designed differently. Like, it keeps changing every day. The designer of the website keeps changing every day, how it, how it is on the phone, how it is on the web. All that changes. Sometimes, like, they might manually call you to confirm the order. These are all like corner cases, right? And, and then like sometimes the person delivering the order is like not even like knowing exactly where to come, and you still have to be on your phone. Oh yeah, no, no, come here, come here, you guide them. Sometimes they may not speak your language. There's just all sorts of corner cases to handle. Then you might be like, damn, I wish I just ordered it myself, right? Uh, so that's the problem with the AI, AI agent today, and we need to address this step by step. Identify small things that can be automated. There need to be some humans in the loop for sure. Uh, this is where there's opportunity for startups because like, uh, startups can figure out ways that are riskier, make some mistakes. For a bigger company, let's say Google has a shopping agent and you know, the order is like, said it's like done, but someone else gets your order instead of you. Right? You would go mad at Google. For perplexity, you're like, yeah, whatever, the startup made a mistake, but it's fine. <laughs> They're trying some new things. So that, that's where I think like, we have an opportunity at the agents game. That's great. Well, I can't wait to order a pizza through perplexity. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. This Thank is great. you. Please welcome Aradi Prabhakar, director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Semaphore Technology editor Reed Albergati remains on stage. so much for being here. It's great to be here. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so um, so you've, been, you've been in Silicon Valley as a VC. You've, you've run DARPA. So you know, I'm sure you know this phrase that you know, AI is anything that a computer cannot yet do. Oh, yeah. So I'm wondering. Until, if, until it can, and then we're like, oh, yeah, that's just like, that's <laughs> how the world works. <laughs> exactly. But if AI is something a computer can't yet do, how do you how do you regulate that? It's, it's this nebulous thing that I don't think anybody quite can even explain. Yeah. Well, first of all, that's not the question we started out with. So l let me tell you the story. Uh, I showed up at the White House at, uh, as the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, which means I'm the president's science and technology advisor. And so that's all of science and technology and innovation. Uh, but I started in October of 2022, and in November of 2022, we all know what happened, which is ChatGPT came into the world. And, you know, AI, of course, had been in everyone's lives already, right? Like, but you didn't know that it was AI if you got a price on an airline ticket that looked different than someone else's, or you didn't know if it was AI that was the reason your loan got approved or disapproved. But all of a sudden, if you're interacting with chatbots and image generators, you know it's AI. And so it really s captured the public imagination, and it became a huge priority for the president and the vice president, and hijacked my entire first year. And, but the, the question that we were asking, the work we were doing, well, the president started by saying, look, this is the most consequential technology of our times. We know how people use powerful technologies. They use them for good and for ill. And so our job, we, we have always approached this job as, managing AI's risks so that we can seize its benefits. And, and what that means today, what artificial, you know, when we talk about AI today, the particular generation of AI that we are in is this machine learning generation where people build compute systems that they train on a lot of data and then they use them to make statistical predictions. And because we're in the information age and there are an almost infinite variety of different kinds of data, um, the applications of AI systems are just phenomenally broad, and therefore the implications are broad. And that, that, was, that was the frame for all the work that we got done in the last year. Yeah. So I, I, I recently interviewed DeepMind co-founder yeah. Shane Legg, and, and he said something. I thought he, he said, you know, if anyone's going to get to AGI first, it might, uh, artificial general intelligence, it, it might be the NSA. They have all this compute power, and they have all the data in, in, in the world, more data than anybody. And I think he was saying that in a, like a, not in a good way, like it wouldn't be a good thing. But I thought about it and I'm like, you know, you've, you've been on the government side, you've been serving for, for a long time um, and pushing technology forward. I mean, 
maybe that's not the worst thing in the world if the government were to be on the cutting edge and like, you know, one step ahead of the private sector on this particular type of technology. What do you think about that? I mean, should we be doing I think that? We're, or? I don't think we're having a very smart conversation about this yet. Because I think what the conversation has been about how do, how do you keep throwing more compute and data specifically at large language models in particular. Sure. And that's, that is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. I'm actually not even sure it's the most interesting question if what you care about is how does it affect people and society and, and the country and global competition. Uh, and I think we need to make sure we're, 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 we're approaching this well. Let me just start with one example for, of why I think there's a disconnect. A lot of the conversation is about the technology and how complex and opaque it is and how powerful it is. But actually, every single thing that we want to use AI to do in the world or everything that we are fearful will happen as people use AI in the world, it, th this is about what human beings are doing. It's humans that are choosing what kinds of systems to build. It's humans that choose the training data. A lot of that training data is about human beings. And then it's humans that decide what applications to use these systems for. And then if you're talking about generative AI, it's actually what comes out of a generative AI system it reflects the interaction between this machine that was built and trained by humans and the individual who's using it. And so I think there are a lot of interesting conversations to be had about AI. Some of them are philosophical conversations. Some of them are like, I feel like I'm in a freshman dorm room at two in the morning kind of conversations. Those should definitely go on. But if we're gonna make smart policy and if we're gonna learn how to build and use AI in ways that are powerful and effective, but constructive and safe, then I think you really have to focus not just on the technology, but on what, what people and corporations are doing. And that's, that, again, that's how we have approached uh, the work we've done to start it on the right track for both getting it right and making it safe and responsible, but then using it to go do big things. Yeah, I I, I want to throw I want to ask one question about TikTok, and I know this is not your specific area, but you probably know Vinod Kosla, the venture capitalist, and Vinod, yeah. he's you know he's he's come out against the t you know against TikTok. He's for the ban, essentially, quote unquote ban, and. A lot of people, and, and I think for a lot, uh, he's become sort of a China hawk. And I think there's a contingent in Silicon Valley that's sort of surprised by that as a, the, the father, one of the fathers of open source and, you know, technology and everything. I just wonder if there's, and you've, you've been on the side again of like with DARPA, of like pushing the U.S. forward in technology. Is TikTok, do you think this stuff you know, that we're doing with TikTok is actually just sort of a fool's errand and trying to like stop another country from developing technology instead of ourselves oh. developing it? Okay, so you just asked about 12 questions, so let me <laughs> unravel that. So let's pull the TikTok thread for a moment since it's timely. So yeah. what's happening on TikTok specifically, this is one part of a larger privacy landscape. We know there are huge privacy issues that our privacy has eroded in this information era and the social media era. It's happened gradually, but we've come to a place that there are some quite deep privacy concerns. It's an area where President Biden has taken action, but has also called on Congress for strong bipartisan legislation. We're hopeful that that's now going to move. We'll, you know, hope, hopeful that that will happen. The, tick, the, the big issue for TikTok from a national security perspective is about the vast amount of information that that platform is able to collect about people, and specifically the fact that because of its ownership, there's, there's a direct line to the People's Republic of China, uh, which is, in, in the geopolitics of today, that is a deeply concerning issue. So it is a national security issue. The president has called for divestment. He has not called for a ban, he's called for divestment. And that's that story, and I think that's, that's one piece of the, the landscape. I think this broader question, I mean, you also mentioned open source, you've talked about uh, all the different ways that you can use technology. Um, I, I wanna disagree with the premise of uh, this session. I, I think the title that you gave this session is, is how people tend to think about it, as you can, you can either go fast and really innovate and do big, powerful things, uh, or you can be safe. And I think that's actually completely wrong, because in fact, I think we're at a moment with artificial intelligence where if we don't figure out how to get it right and be able to assess what AI systems do, 
we won't have, companies won't have the trust of consumers and businesses that need to use it. And as a society, it, people will revert to being concerned and fearful about AI rather than seeing it as something that we have you know, been able to manage and then use to go forward. And so I'm actually for, not for balancing, but actually going hard at dealing with the risks and getting that right, and then going equally hard to use it. And uh, a lot of the conversation about using it is about business companies and what the market's gonna do. And I think that's super interesting. I'm really excited to see. And you know, we're seeing all kinds of startups, we're seeing all kinds of new applications. And I know from my private sector life that some of those will succeed and thrive and others will not. And that's great, I wanna see what comes out of that. I'm really interested in the seat I'm in right now. We've, we've done a lot of work. The president made enormous uh, progress last year in getting AI risks managed. We're on the right track. We've got a lot more work to do. But with, a, with the voluntary commitments, the executive order that he put out, the work we've done globally, including it with the United Nations General Assembly, working with Congress on a bipartisan basis, we've made a serious start and a good start on managing the risks. What comes after that is how do we use it, not just for market and business purposes, but how do we start using AI in powerful ways for the country's purposes? And so think about what the promise of AI for weather forecasting and for materials design to, to create new opportunities for our industries. Think about how we deliver government services or how we change health outcomes. We all know how tantalizing those prospects are, but I think we, in my view, we have to go as hard at using it to do the country's work as we have gone after dealing with it and managing its risks. Right, I mean, I think one of the things people say when they criticize this regulatory idea is that AI's this broad thing. There are a lot of these issues that you talk about like in the blueprint for AI, like bias and, you know, there are already laws against you know, using yeah. algorithms to discriminate against people, right? There are already you know, existing regulations. So if you try to take on AI broadly, you kind of risk, I guess, creating more fear, but maybe sweeping up some of the good you know, with the bad. Yeah, and I, that's exactly why if you go look at what uh, the president signed off on in his executive order, the reason it is so bulky is because it's very clear that AI is a broad technology and depending on the applications and uses, there are very different issues. There are, sometimes there are safety and security issues, sometimes there are issues of embedding bias and discrimination, sometimes there are issues of privacy, sometimes there are issues about how it will disrupt work and the economy. And all of the, or competition issues, and all of those have to be handled. And very much to your point, I think this is exactly right. So many of the things that people are concerned about AI uh, enabling or people using AI to do happen to be illegal already, but that becomes, as a practical matter, that becomes how do we regulate and enforce against it. I'll give you a great example. I think everyone's familiar with um, uh, these systems that filter resumes, right? So you, you get a gajillion resumes. Is there a simple way to filter them? Well, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission exists to make sure that discrimination doesn't happen in hiring, but when resumes are getting filtered by a machine, how do you even know that, that, that that's embedding bias? There's an infamous story of a company that trained a model on current resumes of employees, used it to filter new resumes, and quickly found that they were not finding, they were, no women were getting through the filter. So they realized they had a problem and they fixed it. But right. you know, how does a regulatory agency know and then enforce against the exacerbation of these harms? That's an example of the kind of thing that we now have to deal right. with. Of course, they do that with humans, and you can't know how why humans are discriminated either. But, but I want to before but it's we run a out scale of issue with AI, right? Like the scale at which that's why AI is so powerful is it allows you to do things at scale. It better be good things you're doing. Maybe we could scale. have like one time for like one more thing because okay. I think this is really important. The National AI Resource Pilot yeah. Program, which Super we fun. haven't seen the fruits of that yet, right? Where scientists and startups can get publicly funded compute power to kind of do this stuff. What's the, why is that so important? Why do we need to fully pass that and and, and fund it? 
Yeah, so it, look, the, the really good news is that it's American industries and American researchers that created this most recent surge in AI technology. It's not that long ago that we were all saying, look at China with all of its data and all of its compute, like, they, they're gonna surge ahead. And so I think it's very much to American advantage that this happened in the US, but today, the people who are driving the, this technology are the ones who have access to massive compute in particular, but also data. And we need a broader participation we, uh, in research. We need it to make sure we know how to build and test AI systems that are safe and effective and trustworthy. And then we need it for all these public purposes. And, uh, and we just need a broader set of creative minds engaged in this. That is the purpose behind the National AI Research Resource, which has been recommended by a task force that was mandated by Congress. There's legislation on the Hill to get it going. And while all of that machinery is going on, the National Science Foundation, which will be running this, has started a pilot. And I'm really encouraged by the participation from lots of companies who are stepping up to provide resources for that. So watch this space, but I think there's some very good new research that's gonna kick up as we get that going. Thank you, I wish we had more time. This is really interesting. Thank you so, so much. much. Please welcome Ty Brady, Chief Technologist for Amazon Robotics, and Semaphore Executive Editor Gina Chua. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good to see you all. Um, so, Ty, welcome. And, you know, first, I just want to say thank you to you, thank you to Amazon for all the support. We don't think we could pull this off without, without um, uh, all of that support. Um, but with that, of course, comes a responsibility. That your responsibility is to help us understand this space. And in particular, we want to talk about robotics. Um, and you know, it does seem like there's this moment where robotics is sort of really advancing, and we've seen the videos and all this amazing stuff. And I really wanted to ask you how Amazon's approach to this is because you know you've got a highly focused goal in very in very focused environments which is your warehouse and it's a really sort of very targeted way of thinking about um, about AI and about robots and yeah I'd love for you to sort of just explain what your approach is on this and how it might differ from others great well first of all thank you for having me I really, really appreciate it. it's great to be here um, so I'm the chief technologist for robotics at Amazon, and I do think that we are pioneers in the field. Our approach is a very human-centric approach. Where we extend human capability. We augment our people with the tool sets that they need in order to do the job more productively, create a more safer environment, and also, uh, while we're, we're doing that, uh, uh, allow for a great customer experience, right? It's a very practical, applied robotics approach that's allowing us to accelerate the technology development, particularly in robotics, that is fueled by AI. Do you want to give us some examples? Um, you know, I think we, we were talking in the other room where you said, um, basically, when it works really well, you don't notice it. And, yeah. And that's a very interesting way of thinking about robotics and AI in general. You know, can you give us some examples of? Absolutely. I, I, I am definitely a believer that when you do something well, it should be very simple. It should be almost ubiquitous. So uh, uh, a robot to me is, is the combination of sensing, computing, and actuation in the physical environment, performing a variety of tasks, or maybe even a singular task across this automation, uh, a, a kind of a spectrum of uh, automation. And some of the best robots uh, is your dishwasher. That's an incredible robot. It, you don't, we're not really having any big talks about dishwashers, but it does the job really well. It allows you to get the dishes washed, and it frees you to do higher order things, right? So at home, if you're in your kitchen, uh, it gives you more time to connect with your loved ones. It gives you more time to connect uh, with your family. And if some, someone's going to do the dishes, uh, if a robot's going to do the dishes, fantastic, right? Or you may have a vacuum cleaner. That's a convenience. That's, that is great. I don't want to spend my time 
vacuuming the floors. If, if I can have a robot do that, that's fantastic. Or if there's a pool robot that is going to clean the pool, or if it's uh, an automated uh, lawnmower, those are all great things because I will assure you one thing, you will never out of run. If you're, if you're like my household, I will not run out of things to do over the weekend, right? And it allows me to do um, the things that are most important. So at home, it's about connecting with, with my family, with my loved ones. But in the work environment, I think this is also true. We work hard to develop our machines uh, so that they are extensions of human capability. We really want our robots to enable more productivity mm -hmm. for our associates. We want to uh, enable a safer environment, and we've seen a really great trend uh, with that since we, since we've heavily invested in robotics over the uh, last 10 years. And what that does is when you do, actually, I, I should, maybe should say, when you reframe your relationship with machines mm -hmm. that's human-centric, um, you then gain tremendous productivity. Right? You should not have to have an advanced degree in order to use a, a tool set. You want to give the best tool set to a wide variety of people and allow them to apply them in ways that are very human. We're really exceptional at understanding problems and, and thinking with common sense and, and understanding what, what's the situation, right? We want to augment that. We want to have that as be part of the system where we have machines and people working together, not versus, right? And part of it is I, I just wanted to sort of talk to you a little bit about, so how do you think through sort of the broader implications of using AI and humans and robots together? And I think we I'm talked about stacking excited. boxes. And yeah, I'd love for you to talk about that. It's, it's people and machines working together. I'm very, very optimistic about this. I'm very optimistic about uh, AI and the potential that, that, that AI has, right? Uh, I believe uh, in the goodness of people. I believe that when we give them the right tools, uh, particularly in AI, it allows people to be more intelligent, to be more capable and smarter, right? For example, I'll just give an example, I'll give yeah. a personal example is my daughter is, uh, she wanted to be a doctor since she was knee high, and she's studying re really hard for that right now. She's doing her graduate degree. And she takes uh, an online prep test for the MCATs, which is right. Uh, right, what you need to do. And what it does is it, it assesses where she's strong at, and it assesses where she needs help. And then it'll generate a new test for her, and where she needs help, it'll ask her more questions than where she's strong at, They'll lay off it. What that's doing is that's making her more capable. That's prepping her to, to be a doctor. I love that example. I also love the example if, if many of you, I see a lot of smartphones out there, which is great. You're using navigation to get to places. Yep. What's, what's important? I want to get to point A to point B. That's what's important. You're using a navigation app. There's, there's tons of AI inside of that, right? I, the point that I'm trying to get across is that when things kind of blend into the background and are helping humanity and are helping people, that's the task that is at hand that we should aid with technology. Technology doesn't hinder, actually technology done in the right way actually helps you. And we see that inside of Amazon. We see it's an incredible story inside of Amazon. We've embraced this philosophy. We have the world's largest fleet of industrial mobile robots out there. We have more than 750,000 uh, 750, mobile drives uh, out there. We've created hundreds of thousands of, of new jobs uh, since we've invested heavily in our robotics. Uh, we have uh, increased our uh, uh, our safety record by 28% in recordable injuries uh, over the, just the past four so, years. So, so just give me an example. So how do robots improve safety? Yeah, so uh, th they need to be aware of their environment, okay. right? And they need to allow people to understand where there are potential uh, hazards, right? So, um, and the key part is that you do not ask people to adapt to the machine environment. Mm -hmm. The, the onus is on us to, to build our machines to adapt to the, the human environment, right? So uh, as if, if you have to pick up, say, a, a heavy box, and we, we know about boxes, we ship a lot of the packages out there, <laughs> <You do. laughs> for sure. Many of them come to my house. Uh, you know, what, what my aim, uh, what our aim is uh, very clearly is that I want to eliminate the repetitive, the mundane, and the, the menial. I want to eliminate, I want to automate all those tasks. Okay? And uh, like a, a very typical task that would ask, for example, is picking up a heavy box here, twisting and putting it over, mm -hmm. over here. I, I want to, I wanna, uh, we have a, uh, what we call a robin, which is a robotic induct uh, station. That's a robotic arm. 
that can pick up a box up to 50 pounds and automatically move that. Why is that? That, that is a total win because that person does not have to be subject to the re repetitive stress. Uh, and secondly, it's moving the box very efficiently and it's moving a box. Right? I want that person to be able to focus on higher level tasking, which is working. That is working really well in our uh, uh, many, many fulfillment centers. Well, of course, you know, as, you, as you know, and you've been asked uh, many times, so I'll ask you again, of course, people worry about the, not just the uh, freeing up people to do tasks, but the replacement of people by robots on tasks that they, you know, that they previously did. And, and I know you've thought a lot about this, and, and maybe you could speak to that. I have thought uh, quite a bit about that. Uh, I'll just give you the one line, which is more robots, more jobs. Okay. Right? It is, uh, it's a myth. It is a, that when you add technology in smart ways, what that does, the, the, the myth is that it, it, it destroys jobs. But actually, when you're more productive with a tool set, and we have collaborative robots coupled with our amazing frontline employees, okay? So it's robots in a collaborative manner working with our employees, that gains us more productivity. And when you gain more productivity with a customer-obsessed fashion, our, our job is really simple. We want to have the world's largest selection of goods. Mm -hmm. We want to pass that along to a low cost, and we want to be the ultimate in customer convenience. Right? So we ship a lot of same-day, next-day uh, packages. That's what, that's what we do. And we will focus in a very applied way uh, our technology in order to do that job. When you do that right, you gain revenue, and when you have revenue, you have a choice of what to do with that revenue. We, we invest in people, and we also invest in better robots. And what do better robots mean to us? That means robots that work with people. And when it's collaborative, it's my belief that, that it, it's a system of people and machines working together collaboratively. When you do that, that allows you more productivity. And when you have more productivity, more revenue, more investment, and we create more jobs. And to be sp specific about this is, it's not a few jobs. It's not a few jobs. We, we have created more than 700 job categories alone related to robotics. 700 job categories and hundreds of thousands of new, new jobs. Now, not every company perhaps is thinking this way. So like more broadly, how, how should we as a society, regulation, government, be thinking about how to manage this transition better? Yeah, that's a great question and, and a, a, a reason for a lot of us uh, being here. Um, I think uh, we really need to be mindful of the regulatory environment, right? It, there's a balance. Uh, I flew down here uh, from Boston, came down to DC, and I'm on the airplane, and, and there's a side of me which is like, I'm thankful that aviation is regulated, right? I'm on this oh, yes. tube with a whole bunch of people, and we're flying and to Boston. Hasn't fallen we're off. flying <laughs> over de dense populations. Like, that makes a lot of sense. That totally makes sense. And, uh, where we have existing regulatory bodies, whether it's in aviation or it's in healthcare or agriculture or transportation, that makes a lot of sense, for sure. But when I'm the, where I was sitting, this may be a shocker, but where I was sitting, I'm looking out over the wing. And can you imagine if we were to regulate the wing, regulate the size, the material of the wing, the shape of the wing, like that would be terrible because it would not allow the innovators to innovate. And if we would have regulated that 20, 30, 40 years ago about this is the maximum size of the wing or what the material should be made out of, aviation would not be where it is today, right? You mm -hmm. have to allow the freedom for innovators to operate in order to understand first what the, the field is, how you can, can, can help it, um, and then solve some of these, these, these great problems, right? So, I definitely believe it's a kind of a sector-based approach, whether, okay. you know, what, uh, what sector that you're in, and also a risk-based uh, approach. It's case by case. There's no one-size-fits-all on the regulatory environment, but I'm definitely passionate that uh, I, again, kind of going back to the beginning of how hopeful I am uh, with people. We have amazing staff. I work with amazing women. I work with some am amazing uh, men that are doing pioneering work in, in engineering, in robotics, uh, that are good, heartfelt people. Right? They're making a huge difference. Uh, I believe in them. And when we give them a technology, and I believe in our frontline employees, when we give them technology that works for them, I know that we can solve just about any problem. How do we get that word out to more people to think about it this way? Please do. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, me, let me, you know, you, you bring a very interesting view of, of um, 
uh, of robotics um, uh, to the table. Again, you know, most of us get mesmerized by all the all the um, you know gee whiz um, <laughs> stuff that comes. I mean, tell me, you know, what do you look forward to? What are the things that really excite you that are just over the horizon that you think um, will come and will be transformative? That perhaps you know, with those of us who are not in the industry don't really have a good sense of, you know, what to look yeah. for as a, as a really new, interesting, fresh. Yeah, uh, well, I will say that AI is the most transformative technology that I've ever, has ever occurred in my lifetime. And I know all of you are saying like, well, big deal, because you look so young up there. I get it, I get that. In I the last that. 25 years, yeah. my God. Right, oh, what, five years? Couldn't, couldn't be. I do believe that, though, I, uh, and the way that I am thinking about it is the fundamentals of robotics and the fundamentals of AI, we're still learning. We're still learning. We're doing what I call foundational capabilities, the basics of movement, manipulation, identification, sortation, and storage. Those are basics, how to move things from one side of the room to the other, how to identify objects, how to make sure that we don't have damage detection. And we have machine learning systems involved through the entirety of our fulfillment chain, all the way from our supplier, making sure that we're getting the right goods at, on time, that we can identify them, to the massive fleet of uh, robots that we have inside our fulfillment centers, um, using machine learning, using advanced AI techniques uh, to move and store and sort uh, those goods all the way to the, to, to the customer's door. We're still mastering those fundamentals. And that actually gives me a lot of hope. I have a lot of hope with that. Because I believe that when we master these fundamentals or these primitives of, of robotics, that we can then put them together in very interesting ways besides fulfillment, all the way inside of Amazon for sure, but also for society at large, right? The ability for us to be more human, the ability for us to be more intelligent by leveraging our machines, with the benefit of some really smart, caring, capable inventors and innovators, that's the future for me. Well, thank you. I mean, right now, frankly, I just like the ability to talk to my Roomba. My, <laughs> my partner does, and I have to keep reminding her, you know, you it's, not voice, you like. it's not voice activated. <laughs> Maybe you should just tie your Alexa to my no, Roomba. And then seems we'd be like good. a great idea. Anyway, thank you very much for, for coming in. Really my thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Please welcome Accenture Chair and CEO Julie Sweet. Semaphore Founding Editor-at-Large Steve Clemens returns to the stage. Seventh inning stretch. Lift your hands up. There you go. Let the blood yes. circulate, you know. Uh, why don't you, you take the center stage? Um, Julie Sweet, great to be with you. I want to start this a little differently. We have talked about so many different tracks. We've had a global growth track. We've had an infrastructure track. We've had a global, uh, you know, a kind of developing economy, rising middle class track. Um, so many uh, talks that uh, have been illuminating. But I'm really interested. I don't think we've asked anyone up here particularly in a CEO role, you have 700,000 employees, which is remarkable, it's hard to even say that. Um, I'm interested in the fragility of our times and how things are changing, the geopolitically, geoeconomically, geotech. How has your world changed this year from, say, last year? Well, it's a great question, although I'll, I'll take you back for a moment. I became the CEO of Accenture September 1st, 2019, six months before the pandemic. Ah. And so almost every year since, if you think about what's happened um, every year since, someone has asked me that question because it always seems like I just it was around the corner. Original right? question. <laughs> uh, and I think, I, I do think right now in that context, so it says a lot given what we've gone through in the last five years, right that this is a different moment because of the convergence of so many different things at once, uh, from the technology revolution to the geopolitics, the um, economic pressures to right. industries. And so I have, I have one simple rule 
that I follow myself and I advise other CEOs this year. Very simple. If you look at how you're operating your company and there isn't meaningful change in how you're doing that this year versus last year, then you are probably going to have some trouble. Hmm. Now, why do I say that? First of all, basic things, the way you plan your business today should be different than the way you planned it last year because of the convergence of so many things. Um, yeah, I look at my own self. Like, we did a whole planning. Um, we have a fiscal year that ends August 31st, so we're going through this now. We took an outside in. We brought in advisors, which we normally don't do because we actually wanted to challenge ourselves to say, you know, we think we're really great at this. We advise companies. Let's have someone else come in and advisors really to the that. advisors. Exactly. Yeah. And, and why did we do that? Because that's not we, what we normally do. And it's really important that you are questioning yourself. It does remind me mm. as early days of the pandemic. I talked to so many CEOs. We were all proud, right? We'd gone, you know, we'd changed fast, we'd adapted to this new world. And I would ask one simple question. I'd say, okay, what have you changed though? Because companies do not operate in a permanent state of response. That's what we were all doing, right? It was, it was all emergency and you can do anything in, for a short amount of time. But to actually be faster, right? Remember when we were really fast and decisions were being making, something has to change or the organization reverts back to the rules and the policies and the way it's always operated. This is another moment like that. And so that's a, just a very simple piece of advice. Take it for what it is, but it's something we're doing ourselves. And we have a lot of clients who are doing exactly that. Again, I'm distracted by the size of your company and your role, which is you know, even bigger than, than that in the world. Um, I'm going to ask you a non-AI question here at the beginning. You know, but um, David Brooks wrote a book called How to Know a Person. And as you look at the terrain out there, the problems we're trying to solve, we're thinking of AI and digital answers, do we have a human connectivity problem today? Where, whether it's COVID, whether it's technology, whether it's Bob Putnam and Bowling Alone, you know, a while back, I mean, how do you look at human connection? And because and, we were talking about it off stage, is it, a, is it a challenge for us right now? It's at least a major opportunity Right? So, so many people right now, we're having these great discussions. We live in Washington, D.C., so of course, we're always trying to solve the world's problems. And when you think about it, and why I've, you know, David's book so resonated with me, is it, his book is about how to make sure someone is really seen. How do you listen? How do you have a conversation? And those simple things, when you start to extrapolate them into you know, politics and, and countries make a lot of sense, but they also are a pathway to how to each of us in a world where we do feel uncertainty, some people feel right. fear, that you're not sure is going back to basics, working on yourself as an individual and as a leader to, to listen better, to connect more, only good mm -hmm. can come out of that. Only good. So is AI a friend in that story? Is there a way that AI enhances humanity or is it a dehumanizing threat? That's such a great question. And if you go back to Director Pragabar's earlier comment, I disagree with the question. Uh -huh. Because it was very binary. Right. And I strongly... Well, you strongly, can answer shades of gray. Exactly. And, and, yeah. I strongly agree with where she started, which is AI is a technology and it's not inherently good or bad, it's how you use it. Mm. So at Accenture, our purpose is to deliver on the promise of technology and human ingenuity. Right. Because there is great promise. There is risk depending on how it's used. And I think when you think about AI, um, and this is traditional AI, not even generative AI, I remember work that we've done with an insurance company about how to help senior shut-ins having an AI communication. Now, you'd like to say, well, wouldn't it be much better if someone was talking to them every day? But the reality is that actually wasn't possible, right? And research at the time showed 
that whether it was a human or not, someone connecting about to that senior actually changed health outcomes. Mm. Right, so that was the use of AI to solve a problem. You're not going to make up family and relatives, right? right. So um, there's such great opportunities in AI, and you really have to think about how, how do you focus on those opportunities. You know, um, we both know Steve Ratner, and I'm obsessed with Steve Ratner charts. We managed to have Steve Ratner on stage without the charts, which is a real, real um, miss hit. But I, I, I love his charts. And last year when he was here with one of his charts, he looked at and had you know, a pretty informed uh, analysis, as he saw it, of how artificial intelligence applied in economy would create opportunity for the greatest strategic leap in productivity that we've seen in decades, like really an inflection point. Uh, Larry Summers um, made essentially, in even more grandiose terms, that, that same thing. I'm interested in how you think about AI coming on board. Um, these these uh, predictions on on uh, productivity, and 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 at the bottom of it, what is AI? When you think of it, what problems are you trying to solve with it? Maybe just take a step back for a moment to sort of so what do we do at Accenture? We yeah. serve 75% of the global 100 and the global 500, and so we're working with CEOs all the time. Right. So a couple of months ago, I was with about 200 CEOs of some of the household names, biggest companies in the world. And I asked a very simple question. We had one of those mentee polls, right? right. And I said, is using generative AI one of your top three priorities? Mm. Now, these are some of the smartest, best CEOs in the world. 82% said yes. Wow. I then asked. So it's out there. Yeah, and then I asked, well, this is what's so interesting. I said. Two years ago, if I'd asked you the same question about AI, not generative AI, it wasn't around, would it have been one of your top three priorities? 2% said it would have been. Wow. There is a massive shift. Why? Because this is the first technology in, say, the last 30 years that I can credibly stand in front of any CEO in any industry, put up a chart of their entire enterprise, and credibly say, in each part of your enterprise, there's productivity or growth that is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And when I say credibly, because you know I'm a, I'm a consultant, and a lot of times you go into companies, and but you that's just not just small and, growth, like it's, exactly, yeah. it's material, right? Right, and and so. Now, the span of that, so when we say what's underneath it, what are the biggest opportunities, you can talk about what's the biggest opportunities today, right? So things like contact centers, things like marketing. You know, we're doing some really interesting work with NVIDIA and Defender with Jaguar to like have just a, a completely different customer experience around that car, right? We're doing tons of work with many, many companies around the consumer experience with their contact center. That is about productivity and growth. Um, but what do I get most excited about? Things like what the Khan Academy is doing, hmm. providing personalized tutors, the equivalent. Can you tell that, to, just to repeat that for the audience? So the Khan Academy. Sal Khan. Which you all know, I think most people would know, right? Which provides um, free education to millions of students who can't access it around the world. They're now using generative AI to move from just instruction to providing what's pretty close to having a one-on-one -on -one tutor um, to that, and with great outcomes. Early days, amazing work. That is something that, again, is a problem that cannot be solved without Gen AI. There isn't enough money in the world to provide that. Drug discovery. We're doing amazing work with pharma companies around the world that will take the average drug discovery cycle of nine years right. and over time, like a year, two years. Like that's when you take a year or two years off, there's a ton of productivity mm -hmm. savings, right? The holy grail. But more important, there's a direct link to either saving lives or depending on the drug or a very different experience because of what the drug does. So that's the exciting part. Now, just ground us all in reality. If two years ago it wasn't a top three priority, mm. your biggest takeaway should probably be that most companies today actually aren't ready to use it. Mm. Right? They haven't built all the 
digital underneath technology. Right. They don't have their data. And there's brand new things. So we use the word reinvention. Why do we use that word? Mm. Well, to begin with, because it can actually affect every part of the enterprise. So when you do it, you'll by definition reinvent. But more importantly, because actually to use it, how you use it, you will have to change things. Like we talk about responsible AI. There wasn't responsible PC, right? Yeah. There wasn't responsible cloud. Right. These are brand new things. And so there is a ton of work and opportunity um, ahead to, to actually Does be able to use it. Does it worry you that we're talking about responsible AI? I mean, you operate in, in almost every major developed nation, well, you do every developed nation in the world. Are you worried about how, you know, you saw executive orders on AI from the White House, you saw the um, AI Act out of EU. Are there things that we can do in the regulatory space that would undo innovation, undo AI in a way that you think, I mean, I shouldn't say undo, get in the way of essentially successful deployment? So you're asking the woman who, before Gen AI came out, at the business roundtable, led the work, which was cross-industry, where the business roundtable put out a guide asking for regulation of AI. Right. This is not something we do often. Yeah, right. We did that because... Julie Sweet is pro-regulation. That's right. Because the power of AI is such that you need the balance. Huh. And what we don't want to do is what we discovered with the social media. Imagine if when social media exploded, we had all understood it enough to have had the conversation about responsible social media from the beginning. Right. Right? And we didn't understand it enough. Today, all of that is led to from the beginning, hmm. we're having the conversation. We'll get it, some right, some wrong, but it allows many of us to spend a lot of time on, let's make sure the AI works, because we actually have the right focus. And you can debate regulatory approaches, and I don't know anyone in AI around the world who knows the technology, I literally know of no one who doesn't support some level of regulation from the beginning. It is the only way that we will all collectively benefit from the huge opportunities of AI. Julie, we're just about out of time, but let me just ask you one last unfair question. <clears throat> you know, you, I think you're on the board of World Economic Forum, right? So I am. you're on the board of World Economic Forum in Davos, and and so that's that's one big perch. You talk about the business roundtable. You're involved in lots of uh, associations around the world. I mean, the world is sort of tense. It's kind of screwed up. You know, there's, we've been talking a lot about fragility, tension, stress points. You know, we're walking into a presidential election here that's kind of complicated and high stakes as a lot of people see it, depending on where people are, even in that political equation. Are there any insights you have or insights into blind spots we have that, that you know, how, how, given the fact that you're so, have such a large company, what insights do you have that maybe might be good for policymakers here in Washington, D.C. to hear so that we can get into a better world and a better space? So we talked about one. Let's work on connection. Right. Um, at Accenture, we, we talk about, we have a fundamental leadership essential. Lead with excellence, confidence, and humility. And I think every leader, whether you lead a company, whether you lead in government or not-for-profit, it is a time for profound humility. Hmm. And when you have humility, you are learners. You build great teams. You challenge what you think you know. And I believe right now the world, we can all use great humility in the, coupled with excellence and confidence, which we should all have. Humanity can and will be able to address these issues with a little bit of get to know each other and humility. Ladies and gentlemen, Julie Sweet, Chair and CEO of Accenture. Really appreciate you taking time and joining us today. Thanks, Thank you James. so much. Please welcome Kanjun Chiu, CEO of Imbue. Semaphore Technology Editor Reed Albergati returns to the stage.
household. Um, okay, so conjugate imbue um, is you're trying to create these AI agents that will sort of act on your behalf as a, as a user um, and do things autonomously. And ultimately, I think what it, what it comes down to is changing really what we think of as a computer. So what does a computer look like in this future of AI agents? Yeah, so where we are today, we have generative AI. That's what got everyone so excited. And generative AI, it produces some output, and then as a human, I do something with it. But a type of thing I'd like to do with my computer, and you know, I always say, today we have to micromanage our computers. That's why we get on our computer. It doesn't do anything unless I'm doing something in front of it. And so what I'd like to do with my computer is say, hey, um, I'm getting 100 emails every day, every morning. Please summarize my emails and tell me the top three priorities. And draft a response, you know, kind of have a sense of what I want. And there's no way my computer is going to do that right now. It's just not going to do a good job. It doesn't have the capabilities. And so a way that we think about what AI agents are is they are systems that let us accomplish goals like this on our computer, make our computer smarter, and be able to do things like this. But the kind of classic way that people talk about what agents are is something like Siri or a personal assistant. You know, you think, okay, Jarvis, Iron Man, it's gonna magically tell me what, uh, you know, like I can delegate stuff to it, it'll know what to do. Um, and what we've learned actually from a lot of our user research is people don't want a personal assistant that does stuff autonomously because it's actually, it's even hard to delegate to a human assistant let alone a computer assistant. And instead, what people want is to work much more closely with the system. And this is what it means uh, to kind of reinvent the computer, what the computer can be. And so if you think about in this, I can, you can, if you think about in this world where um, uh, you have this like magical personal assistant, what that actually is, is you're kind of talking to your computer, trying to get your computer to do something. And the agent is a layer between you and your computer, and it's talking to you in English, and it's talking to your computer in code. And so viewing it that way, an AI agent is actually a system that lets you write code in English on your computer. And it turns you into a software engineer, but you didn't even think about yourself as one. That's a great way of putting it. I think the, and if you take that one step further, it gets pretty heady pretty fast because now you're talking about an agent talking to maybe another agent and then talking to another agent maybe out on the web. So for instance, you might say, I want to order something from Instacart. And now there's a, maybe a middleman agent talking to the Instacart agent that then talks to the delivery agent, right? It gets pretty crazy when you think about it. How does that work? Like, how are those things all going to work together in this future? Yeah, you know, I think, again, that's the, like, agents are these autonomous assistants. They're going to autonomously know exactly what to do. But the fact is, they're not that good at knowing what to do. We have a lot of context about what we want in our heads. We have to communicate it. And so a way to think about what's going on with this Instacart example, if I want to, you know, one of our team members, she orders lunch every day for the team. And what she would like is to say, I want an agent that every day takes the orders from this spreadsheet and then goes on DoorDash and picks the orders. Um, DoorDash doesn't need to have an agent that you're talking to. It already has a website. So she could just make a system in English that, and describe what she wants and say, OK, every day pull stuff from the spreadsheet. And then now, given the items in the spreadsheet, go to the right store and then put the, you know, put the orders in the cart. And now this runs. Like what we do, what we would do is to make this run as a program, uh, and then now you can run that program every day, and you don't know, you don't have to be the one ordering lunch anymore. It'll order lunch. So there doesn't have to be agents talking to each other all the time. I think people often have this conception, but really agents are just smart software. And so one of the things in Bu is that it's <coughs> one of these really interesting startups with really smart people but hasn't actually launched its product yet. And so what's the, you know, what's, what's, what's standing in the way? What are the technological hurdles that we need to get over to get to this, to this future that we're talking about? Yeah, that's a great question. So a way that we think about what we're trying to do is it's quite different than what the default industry is doing. So 
by default, the industry right now is trying to build what we call centralized agents. OpenAI will come out with something that integrates with Hertz. You can ask it, OK, yeah, please order a car for me on Hertz. It'll integrate with this other thing. But the fact is, all of us have these really specific niche use cases, and OpenAI is not going to build for that. So for example, uh, my grandmother gets scam calls all the time in Chinese. And my mom, who's actually a software engineer, would really like to build something to prevent the scam calls. She'd like to buy something, but no one's built this, because Chinese scam calls is a really tiny market. No one's going to make money off of that as a tech company. And so uh, you know, my mom is not today, even though she's an engineer, she's not empowered to do this. Um, software requires all of these super specialized skills today. And so by default, the way that people are thinking about agents, these centralized agents, we're not going to be empowered to make these use cases for ourselves. We're still going to depend on tech companies to have you know, use cases that they can make money off of. And so what we're trying to do is make it so that regular people, or you and I, can write software. Um, and so the capabilities required for that are that uh, we think of it as the better the system is at writing code, the better it is at letting me work at a higher level. So today, like ChatGPT will produce code for you. But if you're not an engineer, you don't know if this code is right, you have to be a software engineer to check is the code right or not. But once we get to a point where we can write the code, our system can write the code and then test the code and show me, OK, you gave me this data. I wrote this code for you. Here's the output. Is that right? Now I don't have to touch the code. I can work at this higher level, at the input-output level. So what we're trying to get to, and kind of your point about the barrier, what we want to get to is a point where, as a person, I can work at this higher level. And that's, again, not the default. This is not a capability that people are necessarily driving forward, um, because uh, I think by default, in, like, inventions and technology is not necessarily democratizing. We had a good example of this in the 60s. People were really excited about the supercomputer in the 60s. They were like, everything's going to be supercomputers. We're going to do time sharing on supercomputers. Personal computer first came out. People were like, this is a hobbyist thing. There's no market. And that was true. It didn't have a screen. It was just had uh, you know, buttons and lights flashing. No one could use it. And it took a small group of inventors at Xerox Park to invent the GUI, your desktop, the files, folders, your mouse, all of those things that go into what a computer is today. They had to invent those things to make it accessible to regular people. So we think of what we're doing as inventing the components that make creating software and having control over our digital environments accessible to regular people. And that point about control over our digital environments is really critical. I think a lot of us suffer uh, when it comes to our digital devices today because they're extractive. And they're extractive because we don't have any control over them. We can't say, don't give me these notifications, only give me these other notifications. We can't say, show me just the news that I care about that are related to this bill or this piece I'm working on. Instead, it shows you the news it wants you to see. Software companies that are centralized determine what you want to see. Right. And this is not true of our like physical environment. You know, it's kind of like if I lived in a only if we all live only lived in corporate housing, we couldn't move any of the furniture. Um, and so, well, I think if we were to invent the components that allowed regular people to use this intuitively, then we'd be able to customize our digital environments. So when people have these, you know, I'm visualizing <coughs> now that the the personal computer from zero, you know, the mouse to the keyboard, but for AI, right? And they're able to, to sort of control this digital environment in new ways. What do you think they'll actually do? Like, what are things they don't do today mm. with computers that they will do in the future? Yeah, there are tons of things we want to do with our computers today. And um, I can give you a ton of examples. But a kind of high level way of thinking about it is, once something becomes really easy, then I'll find all sorts of use cases for it. I'll build software. I'll like ask it to do things for my friend group, like maybe remind us all to get together every month and help us organize that, because it's going to take a lot of time to like find the right schedules and match all our schedules. Or I can build something for my community, like um, notify people when it seems like there's someone who is ill or something like that. I can build something for my church. I can build something for my grandmother. Um, these are things where we don't think of ourselves as software creators today because it's not accessible to us. But in this world, we 
it will be effortless enough to create software in natural language that we don't even think of what we're doing as creating software. It feels more like our devices are moldable to our will. So all of these examples of like, you know, I, I actually think a lot of why we have so much polarization um, and echo chambers is because all these centralized algorithms determine what we see. And if we had more control, I could ask Facebook, like, I could say, hey, I want a piece of software that goes on Facebook that only lets me see uh, the uh, posts that are about my friends getting married. That's what I care about. I want to congratulate them. And I don't want to see anything else. I could do that. It's also, I mean, it's so powerful that I'm sure people in this room are thinking, well, yeah, but if you can create those really great pieces of software, you can also then create kind of any type of software that might do things that we don't like, right? Yes. Like automate scams, <laughs> to, you know, for instance. I mean, do you worry at all about that, and how do you think about it? Yeah, definitely. I think our policy work, it, like on the policy side, what we're interested in is figuring out with folks what use cases do we need to actually make sure we have good regulation for. So, uh, and it's a tricky situation. Like, what we're doing is we're building a technology that makes every single person more capable. And what that means is we can do all these good things, and also it means like, it's easier for my neighbor to write a program that surveils me and kind of processes all of that data. And so we have some laws that cover this, but what's going to happen is it's going to uncover a lot of the holes in existing laws. So deep fake porn is an example of this. Deep fake porn, very hard to build uh, some, you know, before generative AI, now very easy, so people do it. Yeah. I mean, there's the other thing is like, if you look at law enforcement, people who are in charge of making sure people don't do bad things or stopping them or catching them, I mean, they are going to have to use this technology too, right? That brings up some interesting questions, like just what happens, you know, are police officers, you know, going to be now writing code uh, in, the, in their day jobs, right? And what does that mean? Have you, th it's like a, is there a cat and mouse game that's going to happen with that? It's a good question. I think the answer, kind of, you might think the answer is yes, but it's harder to make these things than you think. Like, it's harder to write a program than you think, and so, by default, people use what's ac uh, accessible and available. Um, and so I think like, what we'll see is uh, a very, what we'll see is an environment where like, as individuals, we have a lot more empowerment and we're able to much more easily move from idea to execution. And I think by and large, people have good intentions. Like we're trying to do good things and we actually get quite demoralized because we're like trying to do something good, and then there's like all these blockers in the way of our execution. And so instead of thinking of like, is it a cat and mouse game, I actually think of it as if we enable more people to do the good they're trying to do in the world, then by and large, there will be more good things that happen in the world. And we do, we will want to deal with the edge cases where someone is more enabled to do something bad or has bad intent. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, I don't know, we're out of time. I wish I could ask more. <laughs> so thank you so much, Kenjun. All right. Ooh. Thank you. Thanks. Please welcome Rob Thomas, IBM's SVP of Software and Chief Commercial Officer, and Semaphore Chief Revenue Officer, Rachel Oppenheim. And foremost, I just want to thank you so much, Rob and IBM, for supporting this event. It means a lot to us. Um, in order to kick off, I just want to set the table a little bit. So Rob, you are IBM's Senior VP for Software and Chief Commercial Officer. So you are responsible for all commercial activities and revenue for a 60 plus billion dollar revenue technology company. You've spent 25 years at IBM working across many different areas of the business, leading consulting, business development, software, product, services. Um, now you run it all, and artificial intelligence is, of course, the big topic for today and at the center of this discussion. Talk to me a little bit about IBM today and how that compares to the IBM that you started working at almost 25 years ago. It's, it's very different in the last four years, let alone the last 25. But go back 25 years, IBM was a hardware company becoming a services company. And now we're really a software company that also has a consulting business. And so it's very different than what it was even three or four years ago. We're now over 
nearly 75% software and consulting. So I spend half my time on software products. What are we building? How are we competing in things like AI that you mentioned? And the other half is on our go-to-market. We're doing expansion around the world right now. So thinking about different countries that we should be engaging with, working with governments. We've made big investments here in Washington. So that's how I spend the time. Wow. So one of the things that we've been thinking about a lot is you're really on the front lines talking with business leaders, helping them conceptualize and focus on what their AI strategy should be implementation. And one thing that has stood out in a lot of what we've seen is that there's this huge gap between urgency. So 97% of leaders in the private sector say that AI is an urgent priority uh, compared to 14% of that same group that claim they are ready. What do you think is causing that gap? Um, what kinds of conversations are you having with your top customers? What are they wrestling with and, and why the bridge? I think that's a good representation of the discussions that I have. I like to use this phrase, there's no AI without IA, meaning information architecture or data. And every client I talk to, they're intrigued by AI, they want to do something, but data does become either an advantage or an inhibitor. Okay. And so a lot of the discussion becomes, how do you make your data ready for AI? When you move beyond that, I do encourage companies to be really aggressive. You need to kind of move beyond experimentation and have AI working in your company. Around the world in the last nine months, three major use cases have emerged for businesses. First is around customer service. My view is every company in the world will Everybody be- Everybody loves will be their interactions it. with customer service. Are you gonna fix this? Yeah. Actually, Promise me you'll we, fix it. Actually, I would say we have fixed it, but not everybody's gotten on board yet. What do you think? It's no? uh, culture, culture change is slow sometimes. But as yeah. an example, Bradesco handles 200,000 inquiries a month. Bradesco is the big Brazilian bank using Watson X. So it works and it does it incredibly well. We can automate 80% plus of the inquiries. And then the other ones kick out to a customer service representative who's much more informed because they have access to data to answer questions. So this is today, mm -hmm. which is kind of back to my point of, there's no need to experiment. You need to get going. So customer service is one. Second is what I would call digital labor, which is really how do you automate back office tasks? An example in IBM, we've automated a big portion of our HR for things like job requisitions, promotions, salaries. We've gotten to 85% automation rates. This is available to anybody, but mm -hmm. you have to get started. Third is and code. And your data needs to be ready. And data needs to be ready. And third is code. For companies that build software, which at this point is most companies, you can use AI, you can use Watson X to make your developers more productive and we view it as 30, 40% productivity increase within a week, not within a month, within a week. And so these three use cases have become the dominant ones. There's many others, sure. but when I encourage people to get started, I'd say, just pick one of those three. Your success rate is incredibly high. Fascinating. Oh, so one of the things that you just said stood out to me, be aggressive. This is what, that you, this is what you're telling your clients. And I, I think that that's right in large part, but certainly, all of the customers that you guys are consulting with and advising all across the world are looking out on the horizon and see some uncertainty as it relates to regulation and compliance. For example, the EU AI Act is the first real attempt to govern AI, and even though the framework just applies to European Union companies, companies here in the US and other parts of the world operate in the EU will have to comply with these rules. How are you helping steer large, large enterprise companies, your B2B, um, how do you help them think about balancing aggressive, decisive innovation with compliance, risk, and regulation, which is certainly top of mind? We support the EU AI Act. I think they really got some things right. Things like regulating the use of AI as opposed to AI itself. To me, that's fundamental because it's very different if a company is B2C, and is collecting personal information, targeting individuals, that, that usage should be regulated. But that's very different from like the use case I give where 
a customer is automating their back office. I'm not sure we need regulation for that. So this notion of regulate the use as opposed to the technology, I think is critical mm. because we want the tech, we want an open ecosystem. We're big believers in open source. I think we're the biggest open source company in the world once we acquired Red Hat mm -hmm. and we want open innovation. And there are companies that are looking for regulatory capture, which we don't agree with. So we want open innovation, but you have to think about the use, how it's used. I think the EU did that well. Second was they focused on transparency. Our company is using AI, clear sources of data, how they're using it. I believe to this day we are the only technology company that has published the data sources that we use to train our AI. And I think that's a big statement. Makes me wonder why are others not doing that? But it was important to us to be, we're going to put it out in the public domain. People can see exactly what we're using. When was that decision taken? Four months ago, I think okay. we did it. Three or four months ago, somewhere in that range. It's a white paper on the, on the web, so anybody can access it. And it was our statement to say, we're doing things the right way. We're mm -hmm. confident we're doing the right way. Companies that work with us can know that we're behind this. We also went to the point of indemnifying our models. So if clients use models from IBM and Watson X, we indemnify them, which means they have no financial risk to working with us, which I think is a big statement for it that we're standing behind it. So back to the UAI Act, they yeah. were clear on transparency. Mm -hmm. We agree with that as well. They also talked about you need AI that's free from bias. You need to understand how AI is making decisions. We released a product called Watson X Governance, which is how do you govern your AI? So my point is, we're really aligned with the neighborhood that they went to on this. I'm hoping we get to a similar place in Washington. I think we will, because we want a free market. We want aggressive, open innovation, but we also want to prevent bad things from happening. So on Washington, we're here in Washington, and we expect to see a report from the Senate's AI working group next month. Any predictions for what that might contain? Maybe suggestions versus predictions, if I can. We tell, want, us, tell, we, tell us more. We want open innovation. So that means a marketplace of ideas, a lot of companies can contribute. Competition is really good for early technology. I'll give you an analogy. I think. ChatGPT is really just like Netscape. What Netscape did for the internet, it kind of brought it to the public domain. But then think about how the internet evolved after that. I mean, it turned out that Netscape was just, you know, the fireflies before the storm. Mm -hmm. And I think we're at a similar place on generative AI where we're just at the start of what is going to go in a lot of different directions. So yes, we should be clear about uses that are appropriate, uses that are not. but we want open innovation because if we are not open as a country, mm -hmm. other countries will be. And then the U.S. is going to fall behind. That's right. going to be really bad for the U.S. So I think there's ways to approach this. So those would be my suggestions. Let's be aggressive about innovation, but let's be responsible at the same time. Innovation and responsibility can coexist. I'll, I'll end on a kind of big question about where this is all going. Um, one of our speakers earlier in the summit made a reference to a quote that said, technology is typically less impactful than you think it will be in the short term and more impactful than you think it will be in the long term. Do you agree with that? And what do you see over the next, let's call it 25 years into the future? So you've been at IBM leading this technology company for 25 years, forecast out. Do you agree with that sentiment? And where do you think we'll be? I agree with the statement because I think it speaks to there's been a lot of experimentation which leads to some results, but some, you know, poor results. Okay. And I don't think any, hopefully nobody's debating, will AI have a profound impact on society and business and government? I think it absolutely will, but sometimes it takes a little bit longer for that to play out. But this is why I encourage companies, you used to think about your strategy as I have my strategy and I'm gonna add AI to that. I encourage them, think about becoming AI first. So invert that. You have to be AI first in everything you do. And if you do that, you're going to be hyper competitive. I, same view for governments. If we're not AI first in our government, other governments around the world will be, and then the US falls behind. Sure. So I think we're at this moment where, to your point, it could take a while to play out. But 
if you're not aggressive now, you're going to fall behind. That's great. Well, be aggressive, be responsible. Um, thank you so much, Rob Thomas, for your time. Rachel, good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Max Fenkel, Head of Government Relations for Scale AI, and Alyssa Starzak, Vice President, Deputy Chief Legal Officer, and Global Head of Public Policy for Cloudflare. Morgan Chalfant joins them on stage to moderate this conversation. Well, thank you both so much for being here. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, I, I first wanted to ask you about congressional efforts to regulate artificial intelligence. We don't see a ton moving on the Hill these days. There's always trouble getting legislation passed. Um, given the speed that artificial intelligence is evolving at, does it even make sense? Can, can Congress even regulate it, or is it sort of uh, a lost cause at this point, just given how slow government can move? So I think Congress is doing something right in, in many ways um, by actually getting people together and talking about it, thinking about what the underlying issues are and trying to understand what they would even propose to regulate. So yes, there are some, some AI bills, but if you look at them practically, um, a lot of them are asking people to look at things or asking people to develop standards. They're not sort of what you might consider mostly hardcore regulation. But Yeah, I think from our side at scale, and thank you so much for having us yeah. as well today, I think everyone's moving towards the North Star, that is, how does the United States lead the world in the development and deployment of artificial intelligence? And so really starting with Leader Schumer's announcement last April, it was really about how do we learn about AI? And I think everyone's realized AI is a very complicated subject. It's going to be, I think by all accounts, the most ubiquitous technological development of our time. And so with that, to your point, it hits every facet of the hill. There's probably seven or eight committees of jurisdiction this falls into. There's a lot of pieces of it. And so I think we really have appreciated the mature approach that they took both in the Senate with the AI Insight Forums, and we were fortunate to participate in some of them and really see the level of education and questions from the staff and the members and how much they are learning. And then fast forward to the House, where we just saw the launch of the AI Task Force, a similar approach where you have bipartisan leadership from many key committees, as well as members on the topic, to learn. And I think they're really taking a measure twice, cut once approach to understand both where the current laws fit, where we might need new regulation, and then ultimately, what can we do to spur innovation to ensure that US leadership happens? Mm -hmm. And the Biden administration has obviously moved forward on this with the president's executive order. Um, Max, I know Scale AI is part of the Commerce Department's AI Safety Institute consortium. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what your input, what your guidance is to the administration on what they're trying to do? Yeah, absolutely. And so Scale's been working with the Biden-Harris administration for a long time, actually. So it first was signing on to the voluntary commitments mm -hmm. that I think was a really big step forward to see companies voluntarily come together around key safety commitments. Then the executive order came out, and I think we all were really excited to see what was in it and move critical items forward like test and evaluation for federal government AI. That's a really important thing because it ensures that the government procured AI is safe to deploy. With the executive order came the OMB implementation memo, and then a more recent OMB circular, and then as part of the UK summit, we saw the announcement of this AI Safety Institute. And so from our side, it's been really important to see what NIST wants to take on. And I think we've been really happy to see there are gaps and standards we have to fill in frameworks. NIST put out the AI risk management framework a few years ago. It was obviously before generative AI. We needed a company document. That's really what they're working on now, which is building the foundational frameworks that will ultimately guide the standards process for critical topics like red teaming, test and evaluation, how do we ensure AI safety? And that's really where these frameworks are going, and we're happy to play a small role in that. And the White House recently ordered agencies to appoint um, chief AI officers, sort of guide the way that they look at using artificial intelligence. Do you see that as helpful? Does it matter? Is it adding a layer of bureaucracy that's not going to actually end up doing anything? You know, I, I, I actually think one thing um, that we're seeing in the regulatory space in general is everyone is trying, everyone recognizes that AI is the next big thing. Um, and they are trying to figure out how to manage it. And AI is a really complicated subject. I mean, you've heard all today, there are, it can be a million different things to a million different people. And so the reason that you take a role like that is to make someone actually do the hard thinking within an agency 
uh, so that you can figure out what to do, right? And I, I, I think the, the concept is put some resources behind it, really sort of make the agency affirmatively think about it. If you have someone in a role where it's their job to think about it, uh, then they will actually start analyzing it. They will actually start looking at those underlying questions of where could we use AI, because that is their job. So it's not sort of an ancillary job. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've heard Vice President Harris, other government officials from other parts of the world talk about the risks of AI. Um, do you think at all that governments are overstating the risks here and maybe understating some of the benefits? How do you think? <laughs> I, I think we're all trying to figure that out. You know, I, um, I think the reality is um, often governments look and say, um, you know, we've had changes in the world um, and that governments sort of missed along the way. Um, and they, they look at regulation on the internet, um, they look at things that have happened on, on the negative side, and they say, okay, could we have done something different? So could we have backed up um, and, and actually changed something? And they don't want that feeling of maybe we should have done something different to happen again. Um, and so it's not, I, I think the idea that they're looking at the question of risks is a really important one because it's, it's trying to think ahead. I think the question of whether you start to regulate um, to, to, hip, to restrict those risks is a different one um, than actually trying to figure out what they might do. Mm -hmm. And I, what I hope is on the, on the regulatory side that you really start doing the analysis of the risks, um, trying to find the most significant ones, and then focusing your energies there. So risk-based risk frameworks, um, really good way to start um, just from a regulatory standpoint. And Max, one of the things that the Biden administration's focused on is, is trying to reduce or, or eliminate AI from perpetuating discrimination. It's something we've seen the vice president focus on quite a bit. How hard is that? How do you go about doing that? Yeah, so I think one of the things that I mentioned earlier is test and evaluation. And so it's probably important to talk through what test and evaluation actually is. And that's really ensuring AI is safe to deploy for its intended use case. And so when we look at test and evaluation, we've been working on this for a long time, really starting with the DEF CON exercise, which happened this past summer, where we had 2,000 people over the course of three days at the world's leading hacking convention go in and red team or poke and prod and hack the eight of the world's leading large language models. And I think that really was an amazing learning exercise to understand how to demonstrate the vulnerabilities of the models themselves. And we've actually seen companies implement what we learned there and put them into the models so that now if you go in and try the same thing, it doesn't happen anymore. And that's a really cool process to show that test and evaluation works. When you move that out into a policy mechanism, I think what's really important about it is we A, focus on risk-based because not all task carries the same risk and also sector specific to ensure that we're governing, governing the use of the technology. And so for example, if it's a medical use, the FDA looks at it. If it's a transportation use, Department of Transportation looks at it. And so from our side, if we properly test and evaluate the AI, it's gonna be safe to deploy for whatever its intended use is, regardless of what that use is intended for. Mm -hmm. And Alyssa, I wanted to ask you about something your company has developed, which is tools to secure AI systems. At what point do you start to think about sort of the reverse of that, where you're, you're actually securing things or you know, monitoring uh, for AI-enabled cyber attacks or um, you know, something like that? Well, you know, it's, <laughs> when you get into the world of AI-enabled cyber, it's, it starts to get complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about what's happening for most companies, companies are trying to figure out how they use AI, right? So here we had ChatGPT um, kind of hit the scene, and all of a sudden, they had employees going into ChatGPT, asking it to write an email on something. But, you know, as I'm a lawyer, and I think about that, and my stomach drops a little bit, because the reality is sometimes when people type in are, are probably not things that you just want them to type into something. Mm -hmm. So how do you create systems where you protect um, the information that you are trying to use AI on? So there's an element of that, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we think about um, things like data loss prevention, for example, applying that um, to an AI system for your employees? Um, but then also thinking about sort of um, on, the, on the other side, on the AI-enabled side, how do you try to identify those? How do you use AI to find things that might themselves be attacks? And, and that is something, I think, um, when you get into the, the, the world of AI and, and, and things that companies have done for a long time, we as a company, um, you know, we, we, we have something like 20% of the, the world's uh, 
websites that sit on us. Um, and from a practical standpoint, you can't take that amount of data without using some form of AI to look for problems. And so broad data sets um, that enable you to look for anomalies um, across different things, are, it's actually what can drive AI, and it's, it's actually helpful for threat prevention in the long run. And I want to ask both of you this. How careful do federal agencies need to be when they are start using AI, testing ways to actually use it in their operations? We know DHS is starting to do that. DOD is starting to look at it, other agencies. What, yeah, what's like the level of um, care and, you know, is, are there ways that you think it could be counterproductive potentially? So maybe I'll start. I think first and foremost, if we want to truly lead the world in the adoption of AI, that means our government agencies need to start adopting AI. And what we've seen is a lot of the agencies make forward-leaning steps. At the Department of Defense, we saw Task Force Lima, which is their generative AI task force. You mentioned Department of Homeland Security came out on some of the pilot programs they're doing. And I think it's really right now about learning the technology and how to best implement it into their daily workflows. Because what we've seen from a near-peer competitor standpoint, we're not, we can't slow down. We have to keep our foot on the gas pedal. With that, though, comes we have to put it through the proper safety rigors to ensure it's safe. We saw a big step forward last or a few weeks back now when we got the OMB circular talking about test and evaluation for government procured AI. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing how that's getting implemented right now at the agencies, because what that really is doing is building on an NDA requirement for the Department of Defense and the intelligence community and the executive order, which talked about if we're going to use AI in the government context and procure it, it needs to be safe to do so. And that's why I think we feel that test and evaluation is so important. Mm -hmm. Alyssa? Yeah, I, I agree with that, that concept. I think, I think the idea that governments have to use AI is right. Um, and the, 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 the long-term challenge for them is to find ways to do it that, um, that actually match what they are trying to do and, and improve efficiency, even for them, right? So um, I think the red teaming is an important component of that. Um, I think thinking about the tool sets that you apply on top, how you think about protecting data sets, they can actually also be kind of a leader for, for entities in the, uh, in, the, in the private sector about how you do it well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really what they should be striving for right now. Mm -hmm. And Max, on the national security implications of, of AI, as I mentioned and you mentioned, Pentagon looking at this, Israel also reportedly used AI to strike in Gaza. What do you think about AI for you know, autonomous weapons or strikes like that? Is, how dangerous is that? Is it? Yeah, so scale is very public about that. We work with the US government and we're happy to support the, the US government in, in our mission on national security. And I think what we've really seen is within the national context right now and as we look around the world, everyone is starting to incorporate AI for public sector use cases. And so from the United States perspective, I think we are doing the right things and better understanding how AI can change the face of national security, as well as keep up with our competitors. If we look at what China's spending on AI, it's about three times from a government perspective. If we look at the number of large language models they're producing and the quality of it, we're seeing a, a lot of high quality models now coming out on an open source perspective. And I think if we don't keep pace with that, if we don't put the right regulatory environment in place, what we'll see is the world's leading open source models are Chinese. And so the world's open source AI, which is being used by our allies abroad, would therefore then be trained on Chinese LLMs. And you'd see, in our opinion, a form of digital Belt Road initiative come to light. And it's really important then that we don't bottle the technology too early. We need to ensure that the US and our allies have leading AI systems so that we can lead the world in the adoption of it for national security missions as well. I'm glad you mentioned China, because that was actually my next topic. Um, do you feel like China's winning the AI, AI race then, right now? I, I think from our perspective, the world's leading AI is still being developed in the United States. We have the world's best talent in the United States, and we have the world's best companies wanting to do business here. And that's a really powerful tool. However, what we have seen over the last six months or so is about 80 different large language models produced in AI. We've seen them continue to make progress. And if you look at the leaderboards now, there's Chinese open source models near or at the top of it. But I think we still feel confident that the US is leading the world. However, that means we can't take our foot off the gas pedal because we do face real competition abroad. Mm -hmm. I think I would add to that. I, I, think, I think the goal should be for innovation on part of it, right? So one of the things that we do actually um, from a company standpoint, we think about how you can take open source models and actually uh, start to build on them, right? So what do you do with an open source model? What does that mean? How do you think about the infrastructure necessary? So we actually have a platform where you can take open source AI models and then build on it. Um, so 
literally we have infrastructure that enables you to then deploy it in, 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 at, a, at scale, um, which is one of the challenges about having a, a small business that, that, that might use AI. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think we have to think about other ways like that to innovate, think about what, what controls look like in the long run, and that helps enable, um, and enable things more uh, just from an economic standpoint, which then has national security implications. Um, I'd also say be very careful conflating um, AI and automation mm -hmm. automatically, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because they are not the same. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when, uh, when you get into a, a, something like a conflict zone, um, what the US might think about doing, um, they, they, it's very, it may be very important to use AI just to understand what a battlefield looks like, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean um, that it has to be paired with automation. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, often the question of when, it, when is a human in the loop, what is a human looking at, um, becomes really important, and that situation um, it, may, it may be one that a human stays in a loop a lot longer uh, than, than you might think. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you both so much. And thank our audience for this wonderful gathering and conversation. Thank you. Last week, Semaphore founding editor-at-large Steve Clemens sat down with UPS CEO Carol Tomei for a conversation on innovative technology changing the face of global shipping. Carol, thank you so much for joining us today at our big World Economy Summit. Sorry we couldn't have you here in person, but I wasn't going to have this conference go without a conversation without you. Let me just start out and ask you, and we're talking about the future of mobility, and we're used to the big brown trucks, we're in, you know, we've seen the planes. I'm interested as you look out 20, 30 years from now, which I know that's what you're investing in today, what does the future of UPS mobility look like? What are the platforms that may be even high risk platforms that you think we need to be um, investing in so that we've got far better mobility options for tomorrow. Well, Steve, it's so nice to join you and good to see you again. And let's talk about mobility. First of all, I would say that our service providers, the men and women who are delivering packages to your doorsteps and your businesses, they represent our brand. So while we could be investing in autonomous package cars and robots that could deliver packages to your door, I don't think so, because our people are our secret sauce. So we aren't investing any time or energy in autonomous uh, vehicles for delivery. But when we think about those big 18-wheelers that are crossing the interstate, um, there's an opportunity for us to invest, and we're doing that by investing in autonomous feeder vehicles. Now, we need a little help from the states to allow for interstate commerce of autonomous vehicles, but we think that's the right thing to do from a safety perspective as well as a sustainability perspective. And just speaking of sustainability, you know, we've had some real success in lowering our greenhouse gas emissions down almost 14 percent, but we still emit a lot of greenhouse gas as one of the largest logistics companies in the world. And the long pole in the tent, well, it's aviation fuel. So, so if you think about mobility and sustainability, we need a solution for sustainable aviation fuel. And that's going to take all of us working together to find that solution. But we're all in and trying to do it because it's the right thing for business and the right thing for the planet. So I hear you're going to keep a human face on package delivery, particularly to people at their homes. And it's interesting about interstate trucks and whatnot, but I know you and I in the, in the past have talked about, you know, drone delivery of certain things. Are there other elements in the, in the matrix of transportation inside UPS that may not be that front-facing thing that are more diverse than, the, say, the shipping connection? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about just how we operate the network. We have an integrated network, the best integrated network of any player. But inside that integrated network, it's still very labor intensive. So when we think about mobility inside of the building, we've just kicked off something called Network of the Future. And that's us reimagining the network as if we were building it today. We've invested in automated sorts in many of our buildings. But gosh, if you walked in our building, you still would see a lot of manual processes, manual label application, manual unloading and loading of doors, 
all of this is ripe for automation. In fact, we've laid out a plan to automate our network here in the United States and deliver real productivity savings, almost $3 billion of productivity savings over the next five years. And we'll recognize about 50% of that in the next three years. So technology and automation is certainly the future of the logistics industry. You know, you talk about reducing greenhouse gases by 14%. And this is something I've really never asked a CEO because they all have carbon neutral pledges. I think UPS has a carbon neutral pledge uh, by 2050. And I always wonder, is, is, are, are the first steps in the lowest hanging fruit? And does it get harder and harder, you know, each percentile? And, you know, you talk about the last mile and getting broadband to Americans and how complicated that can be. Is the last 20% going to be really, really tough when it comes to hitting those goals? And, and, and what do you think we're going to have to do to, to achieve them? Well, you know, we electrified our first vehicle in the 1930s. So sustainability has been part of our history for sure. And we run a rolling laboratory for vehicles that are powered by some sort of an alternative fuel. We've got about 18,000 vehicles powered by some alternative fuel. So maybe that is low hanging fruit for us actually. And we'll continue to power our vehicles with alternate fuel. Renewable energy powering our, bu our buildings is another way that we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Really, the long pole in the tent, the, the problem to solve, and it's going to take all of us working together, is sustainable aviation fuel. For anyone who's flying cargo around the world, you know, you burn up a lot of fuel, fossil fuels to do that. So we've got to work on that solution, and it's going to take longer. Well, one of the other areas I think I talked to you about last time, Carol, we were in the midst of a you know, significant COVID crisis and coming out of that. And, and basically global commerce had a heart attack, had a heart attack about you know, where things were made and where you know, production was able to get to the markets where they were needed. Um, and, and basically in a high fear economy, people begin trying to buy everything and hoard it as, a, as opposed to a high trust economy where you get a much more natural flow, just in time production. I'm interested in your role in the middle of that with supply chains and moving goods in that to deal with the heart attack victim, uh, which is the United States of America, and how and, and and do you think it's recuperating? Well, global trade lanes are certainly shifting. Twenty percent of manufacturing has left China and moved to countries like India, Mexico, Vietnam, Thailand, and more. And as those global uh, or manufacturing shifts are happening, we have to follow those shifts to make sure that we can provide service to the shippers who are shipping goods to the United States and other country. But here's the interesting thing. Asia is still very important from a global supply chain perspective. Of the um, 80 largest trade lanes around the world, 49 of those trade lines have an Asia country on one side of the trade. And 22 of those trade lines have an Asian country on both sides of the trade. So we as a logistics company, well, we have to understand that and we have to invest in that. In fact, we just announced a major expansion of our air hub in Hong Kong, which serves the Greater Bay China area, which is 37% of all China exports come out of the Greater Bay. We've also announced a big air hub in Clark, Philippines, which will allow us to participate in trade lanes that we don't today. So it's important, I think, for all of us who are in the logistics world to understand what's happening with trade and lean into those changes so that we can keep commerce flowing. The other interesting phenomena is what's happening with nearshoring in Mexico. And I think that's going to be a real opportunity for all of us. Well, one of the things we've been discussing uh, well, among the many topics at this conference is how national security and geostrategic concerns are now part of the economic picture in a way they haven't been for a very long time. And we've been talking about how even in the White House, the National Security you know, Council meetings now include uh, the Secretary of the Treasury uh, on a, on a you know, mandated basis. So it's a very unusual thing. Are you worried at all that as you're moving these lanes around, there may be a blind spot about how significant Asia is and about the fact that when you look at the future of the next global middle class, so much of it is, is going to be in Southeast Asia and the kind of broader Asia region. Are, 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 we, are we missing uh, something there? 
Well, there's no doubt that trade follows geopolitical tensions up and down. And I think we need to be very aware of that and build in enough flexibility in our supply chains to adjust and be agile. Let me ask you about your workers. And again, something that I think any CEO I talk to of a major transnational firm says his or her biggest challenge is try to think through upskilling. How do you maintain the partnership with labor and your workers while dealing with the inevitability that technology is going to be woven into this more? Well, I think it's important to be intentional about upskilling and not just talking about it. So we've had a university here at UPS for IT for a number of years but it was only offered to IT professionals. We're now opening it up to others. So if you have a propensity and a desire to learn how to code, we will teach you. Because we've used artificial intelligence and machine learning in our network for years. It's how we have the best integrated network because of technology. But with generative AI, many, many jobs are gonna change. It's super exciting. And as those jobs change and maybe are no longer needed, we need to, we need to be intentional to provide opportunities for people if they have the desire to learn new skills. Carol, let me ask you about cybersecurity because when I think of your company and the role that you play in, in not only American economies, but frankly, the entire global economy. But you can see the same thing in power providers. You can see anyone that's servicing a great number of people that has a digital backbone. How vulnerable or not, on a scale of one to 10, how safe do you think our big networks are from nefarious players in the cyber world? We are all under attack 24 seven and we I think acknowledge that and need to make sure that we have staffed our companies with the right security protocols. Get this, we have 20 petabytes of data. Imagine how precious that data could be to someone else. So we are diligent against fighting the threat actors that are all around us every day. Um, and we're intentional about it. We invest into it and it's job number one. I'm going to have to go look and see how many bytes that is, because I sort of lost after terabytes, I guess, but, but uh, it sounds like an awful lot. Well, listen, Carol Tomei, uh, CEO of UPS, thank you so much for joining us again this year. My pleasure. Carol, thank you so much for joining us today at our Big World Economy Summit. Sorry we couldn't have you here in person, but I wasn't going to have this conference go without a conversation without you. Let me just start out and ask you, and we're talking about the future. Please welcome OpenAI VP of Global Affairs, Anna Makanju. Semaphore Technology Editor Reed Albergati returns to the stage. All right, Anna, thank you so much. Um, really Thanks excited about me. this. So I want to start off with just an easy, light topic: <laughs> elections. Um, OpenAI is, uh, you know, obviously a lot of people are are worried about this. What exactly do these foundation models, what, what are the real threats when it comes to democracy and elections? And, and what do we not actually have to worry about? Like help us sleep at night. A <laughs> well, I think probably the number one question I get, uh, particularly from policymakers, which is the community I speak with most often, is around deep fakes. And <clears throat> this is a, it's a bit difficult because obviously this means that there is these models will mean that you can have much higher quality disinformation and misinformation, images, video, audio, et cetera. But I think what um, is unclear is what impact these are actually going to have because there is, of course, misinformation and disinformation out already. It's, and in many ways, like this is, this is what I'm hoping will help people sleep better. We've been dealing with it for a long time. And so we already have tools to address this. Um, you know, journalists obviously fact-checking this information, um, people being aware that they need to go to trusted sources, et cetera. The difficulty, of course, is that um, even if no one piece of disinformation, no deep fake really has a huge impact, there is something we call the liar's dividend, which means that people may begin to distrust um, everything that they see. And so what we're, what really I think we need to do is strike a balance between awareness and ensuring that we are generating awareness that these tools exist and overstating the case that nothing is real anymore and people can't trust their eyes. Of course, we're working on provenance. For example, C2PA, which is a, a digital standard, um, part of it is attaching data to images, um, to video, so that people are aware 
that this is a deep fake, and of course, collaboration with media, with, uh, with social media, with traditional media, so that um, there, you know, this is, this is actually standard used already by the New York Times, by the BBC, by Sam, you know, uh, Nikon, so that's, it's great that it's an ecosystem tool, and I think we need more things like that that are adopted by the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so the, the, it's kind of scary that the, the problem can become, you know, or the solution can become the problem. Um, I want to talk about uh, your global footprint too. You've been—you just opened up an office. I think you just came from Japan, actually. We opened up an office. Um, you're doing do deals in Dubai. Why does OpenAI need to be so global in nature? Like, what is it about this technology that requires that? I mean, the the incredible thing about these models is that they were they they became global. Uh, incredibly quickly, partly because they are already multilingual. And so they work really, really well in tons of languages, including languages with a relatively small number of speakers. Uh, one of my colleagues that uh, I have worked really closely with, for example, he speaks uh, Serbian and Slovenian, each you know, one or two million speakers, and he was able to use them uh, you know, as of two years ago. So there's just, you know, I, I, when I go uh, to visit my family in Nigeria, I practice my Yoruba. <laughs> with ChatGPT, so that I'm not too embarrassed. So you know, they they have they already have this global reach in, inherently, and of course, it's really important for us to make sure that we're actually having conversations with all of these societies around what it means for them, because it's not going to people are not necessarily thinking about it in the same way uh, across the world. Well, we think of, I mean, here we're just you know worried about it. We talk about the downsides. What is the discussion happening, say, in the global south? Like, yeah. How do people, if you could characterize how they view this technology, what, what is that? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's incredibly different because, of course, everyone is interested in the guardrails and how do you prevent harm, but sort of the balance of that conversation is extremely different in the global south. They're much more interested in how are we not going to be left out. They see that this has immense potential. Um, it has the potential to solve huge challenges. I mean. We have incredible examples here. We have this partner called Digital Green, and they work with agricultural extension services, which means they go to people, you know, you have a tiny farm, you're like one farmer with a small farm, and so these agricultural extension workers go to farmers and, you know, if you have like a crop disease or you're trying to figure out which crop to plant in which part of your field based on the conditions, um, agriculture extension service workers will help you. And they started using our models, and so they went from having to pay $35 per farmer per year to do the service to 35 cents. So you can imagine like the, the, this way that it scales your ability to serve um, these communities. But these models are getting bigger every year. That means more expensive to train, more expensive to serve. You need huge compute infrastructure. You need access to hardware, which, you know, uh, we don't have nearly enough of, and they are really worried that, th that this is only going to exacerbate things for them, that they're going to be left even more behind. So they're super focused on leveraging it, getting access, maintaining access. Does it make sense, though, for OpenAI to be spending that money on that infrastructure built, you know, around the world? Like, if there's not as much of like an ROI, like people in the global south, they're not going to be paying the the you know the premium subscription right for for OpenAI models, I imagine. But this is the unique thing about OpenAI is that ultimately we have a uh, an obligation to our mission, and that is to make sure that this technology benefits everyone. So we are able to make choices that are not necessarily ones that a traditional company could make. This is one of the most exciting things about working at OpenAI. I mean, here, even in the US, we've had this conversation this the past couple days about broadband access, right? And it just, you know, in the rural parts of our country, I mean, is that, a, is that an impediment, do you think, to, to AI sort of helping everyone? A hundred percent. I think it's one of the things that keeps me up at night, which is that, there are, you know, every Fortune 500 company, virtually every Fortune 500 company is using our tools, for example. That's great. But is that really going to make sure that we fulfill our mission? Um, so this is actually one of the reasons that I am extremely bullish uh, on government using it, because they are ultimately the, some of the biggest providers of services to people who need them. And because the, you can scale, um, make services more accessible, make them easier to deliver, um, I would really love to see that accelerated because this is, I think, one of the most meaningful ways you can get people who don't have access otherwise because they don't have broadband or they may not have a smartphone um, get access. So do you, are you seeing like government saying, oh, this could be the impetus for us, like we really need to ramp up our broadband 
access programs, which I think have been kind of like in question in recent years? Yeah, no, I think they, I think they are. I, I think that this is actually causing lots of people to realize that on top of the limitations that this already um, has you know, uh, generated, that the AI is going to possibly exacerbate the situation. So you really have to go back and think about what are the, how to solve those bottlenecks. I know Sam Altman and others have talked about the speed of this development of this technology being sort of the thing the real question, right? Not just in terms of, you know, how fast does it potentially disrupt labor, but, you know, just how fast it kind of freaks people out. I've talked to people who, um, who've tried, you know, GPT-5, which is not out yet, but, you know, I've talked to some people who've played around with, with who've said they've played around with it. I think they're and they wrong. Say it's, <laughs> okay, well, that's interesting. <laughs> um, but they have said it's pretty, it's, it's, you know, kind of mind-blowing, maybe not quite, AGI, but do you worry at all about like this stuff just, you know, when GBT5 comes out, people just being like, oh my God, this is too, too capable, I'm, I'm scared of this technology? Well, this is why what I, we are working on is putting our thumb on the scale of it, people doing as many things as possible with it, where rather than being scared, you're like, oh, thank God. Now we can do this. Now we can achieve these things. Um, I was actually just back there talking to the CEO of Moderna, who you're gonna talk to in a little bit, and just watching what they've been able to do is absolutely incredible. Um, and so we're hoping that it, this is what it's going to do. It's going to accelerate drug discovery. It's going to help us solve climate change challenges. It's going to help us build fusion reactors. That's the dream. But I do think that there is an issue where people are not engaging with it enough. Right now, even as much as we talk about it all the time, and it feels like I see 100 articles about it every day, I also am in meetings all the time with policymakers who are like, so can ChatGPT do this? And you're like, a meeting with me is not necessary to find out the answer to that question because you can just use it. Um, but not <laughs> a lot of people are actually doing that. I think, um, and thanks for previewing the next panel, I think I, <laughs> you mentioned climate change. Um, how are we, these things are just getting so huge, like unfathomably huge, the data centers, the GPUs. How are we, you mentioned fusion, obviously that like GPT-5, that's also not out yet. Um, are you, are you, how are we gonna power this? Can we power all this stuff in a green way and, and what does that look like? I'm really hoping that this actually creates an impetus for investment in more green technology because we do see that the amount of energy that is necessary is going to skyrocket, partly because demand for this technology is so massive. It's not just us. You know, this is I, the amount of investment in this technology right now uh, across the board is in, immense. And so um, there is, I, I see no ceiling right now to this demand. So I really hope that to the extent that people are seeing uh, these energy demands increasing, that, that this will really spur more investment in green energy. At the same time, we are using this technology to become more efficient. Um, we, like the amount of efficiency in, in terms of utilization uh, of our hardware that we've been able to find using this technology um, has been significant, and I'm hoping that as these models get smarter, they will only help us do this more. So I am hoping this will be a virtuous cycle. Yeah, so ask ChatGPT how to make the GPUs <laughs> run more efficiently. That's great. Um, well, we are, the clock is zero. Oh, that was um, fast. <laughs> I know it did go by really fast. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. All right, I'll stay up here. Please welcome Moderna CEO Stefan Bonsell. Semaphore Technology Editor Reed Albergati remains on stage. Okay. All right. So I think we talked about six months ago. Yeah. Um, I was asking you about AI and drug discovery, something that I love talking to people about and writing about. Um, it's still, it's still, or it was very early then, it's still early now, but are you, since then, are you more optimistic that it's really gonna work or less optimistic? Well, good afternoon and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm more optimistic because we've been using the tool a lot and some of the insight we're starting to get from a scientific standpoint are things that none of us scientists were aware of. So the tool is really being a great assistant to give us insight because we have so much data 
it's almost impossible for any of our most brilliant scientists to get everything in their head and to be able to see connections between the data. So I think the drug discovery is going to be a, a huge impact on healthcare, but it's going to take time because once you have a new insight, you have to take that drug into the clinic, test it, make sure that you do it safely mm -hmm. uh, before you can bring it to the regulator for them to decide if they want to approve it. But I think the early part is going to be massively accelerated. And also we're going to go into spaces that we have not been able to go as a society. I mean, think about medicines today. Is if you understand the disease, you'll find a way to go fix it. Mm. But think about Alzheimer, you know, think about cancer. The reason we still have people dying of cancer, people suffering from Alzheimer, is we do not understand the fundamental biology of those diseases. We have hypotheses which lead people to develop drugs, but we don't have true foundational understanding of those diseases. And so I think we are, in the next three to five years, going to be able to understand most diseases that we do not understand today. And that's going to be a first in the history of humans on the planet. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, and you said early development, right? So are you just seeing, like, if you can glimpse into the Moderna, you know, lab right now, do you just have way more can you know, early candidates now for drugs than you used to because of, of AI? Or what does it look like on the ground? So it's interesting because mRNA is an information molecule. Sure. We always have had m more drugs in research that we can literally even fund in the clinic. Right. That's always been a happy problem of Moderna. Um, it's bigger now. <laughs> it's just a bigger problem now because of AI. It's allowing us to explore new space uh, that we do not know how to get into, uh, get mRNA into new cell types so we can open brand new verticals of application of a technology that we can go and and drug different diseases, so that's really exciting. So that's the research side of things. But I think the first impact patients are gonna benefit from is on getting drug faster. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about drug development, it basically starts with this idea of a scientist, I want to try this for cancer. You try an animal, when you get good data, you ask the FDA based on your data to go to the clinic, you go to the clinic, it's a human experiment. We call it clinical trial. But it's basically a human experiment, very controlled, very safe. And then if you have good data, you go back to the regulator and ask them to approve a drug. So if you think about all the things I talked about is data, 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 data. We spend our time looking at data and making decisions based on data. And so as Julie from Accenture was talking about earlier in this seat, if you look at all business processes that we have to use to get a drug from an idea in the scientist's brain to animal data, into the clinic, into filing to the regulators. There's so many business processes you can accelerate today for all the drugs we are doing with AI. So one example that we shared a few weeks ago, we had our annual vaccine there, and the, the team sh shared a, a GPT that we use on, on OpenAI Enterprise, you know, GPT Enterprise, that the team built to do those selection. In pharma, you always have to test different dose level in a clinic to pick which dose you take into your big phase three to prove to the regulator and to yourself that at that dose, you have efficacy, but the drug is still safe. Mm -hmm. Usually, this process takes a long time because mm -hmm. everybody has an opinion. Uh, sometimes it's rational, sometimes it's emotional. Um, what is interesting is the team built the GPT. We get the answer in three minutes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so you take a very long process into three minutes and think about the yeah. hundreds of processes we have between this ID and the drug being available to patients. So I think that we're going to be able to bring drug much faster, benefiting patients much sooner. So um, another area that we've talked about is diagnostics, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how is, how is AI helping in that regard? Like, what are you seeing out there? So. Again, I think there are a few things. First is you have the ability to better understand basic biology. So you can test for things that might be wrong or right in your body that you couldn't before. So you're just expanding the domain of what you can test for. If you look now, there's more than 200 tests that you can run regularly to know more about your human body. Mm -hmm. And not even talking about sequencing yourself, uh, just blood work. 200 tests you can do now on your blood. That's mm -hmm. pretty cool. But you can think about thousands down the road to a very clear picture very early on of disease progression because 
you don't get cardiac disease overnight. You don't get diabetes overnight. You have a lot of signals, a lot of things I think to go wrong very early, that if you see those early, you can correct them. So again, we're gonna move into a world a bit like Star Trek where the people get a lot of diagnosis on a lot of things. When you'll be able to have an AI system looking at all those things and learning through all the data it's getting for all the patients. So that's gonna be quite interesting. And when, because you have this improvement in diagnostic and the acceleration in drug discovery and, and drug development, the thing you're gonna to start to have is individualized treatment. Mm. As you know, because we talked about it in September, Moderna is in a clinic with very exciting individualized cancer treatment, where literally if you get diagnosed and I get diagnosed of having skin cancer the same day by the same doctor, we will take a, a little biopsy of your tumor, we'll do the same for my tumor, we'll take a sample of our healthy cells, our blood, and we're gonna look at all the DNA mutation in your cancer cell, we'll look at all the letters of your DNA, this will be done by a computer, not by a human, you know, three gigabytes of letters, human will make mistakes, computers will not make mistakes if, if well programmed and, and well controlled. And then we will design at Moderna a different treatment for your melanoma cancer than my melanoma cancer. It will be a different chemical molecule. Just, just like the COVID vaccine, but it's going after skin cancer cells instead of in your body, right? It's Correct. attacking the, the right cells. Correct, so what we know today, and it's not a modern innovation, it's a medical field, is that the immune system role in eating your cancer, we have cancer all the time. I had cancer cells today. Yeah. Uh, and most probably all of you too. Uh, but your immune system, if you're healthy, which is why sleeping, doing sports, eating well, is really important. If your immune system is strong, your immune system is gonna see the first cell that becomes cancerous, i.e. having mutations, and it will just eat it. It will never become two cells and four cells and the tumor that will be growing. Because yeah. when your immune system becomes blind to your cancer, and what we figured out at Moderna is how to design an mRNA coding for the signature of your cancer, mm -hmm. that would be different than my cancer because we will have different mutations, mm -hmm. um, and to code that into one big molecule, that will make in around 30 days just for you and one just for me, yeah. that will be injected, not to treat the cancer directly, but to teach your immune system and me to teach my immune system yeah. what it missed to then go and eat it. Yeah, I mean, what's so fascinating about that is it, it, the precision that you need, right? Because if you go after the wrong cells, then you have an autoimmune sort of reaction that's bad, right? And, Correct, I mean, which is why we always start by looking also at your healthy DNA yeah. to know what does a healthy cell of your body look like. Right. And then when we sequence, or we lead, read all the letters of your cancer cell, yeah. we figure out where has mutation happened? Where has your DNA gone wrong? That's what cancer is. When I and forget we, to put skin uh, uh, sunscreen on my kids, I tell them about this vaccine. I tell my wife about the vaccine. She doesn't go over very well. You, you should still put skin uh, <laughs> cream. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you on the, on the personalized medicine thing, um, it seems like you've got this sort of thing happening with regionalized medicine now where it's almost like the stepping stone to personalized medicine where you have like, you know, places like, you know, the UAE wanting to get into drug discovery and deal with, you know, diseases that are more specific to their populations. Is that, do you think that that's how we get there? Is that happening? I think they're both happening at the same time. So uh, we just spoke about individualized medicine that's happening. Um, we have developed partnership with the UK, Canada, Australia, and we're having more discussions ongoing to build a plant in their country so that the flu vaccine, the COVID vaccine, will be adapted to the mutation present in their country. If you look with flu, for example, around every four to five years, you have around twice as many hospitalization in the US, it's true around the world, and almost twice as many deaths than a normal year. Why? Because you have a, a strain mismatch, which is the flu strain that the WHO guessed around February changed significantly from the one circulating in the US next fall. Right. And so the vaccine is not really super adapted to the strain circulating, and you get twice as many people hospitalized. A lot of people die because of that. It's terrible. Yeah. But think of a world where we could decide because we know we can make the vaccine around 60 days. We've shown it the last two seasons with COVID. Yeah. Think about the FDA deciding just for the US, I don't want the global strain. 
Mm. I want the strain that is emerging in the US right now. Mm. Think about a world where you have a new mutation in flu happening in October. And we can make a new batch for, let's say, people at high risk, not necessarily for everybody, but you know, people that have cancer, people that are older, people that have a lot of comorbidity factors, people who want to be protected because there's still Thanksgiving ahead of them with a lot of risk for spreading. There's Christmas ahead of them. And so we can do that, which you cannot do today with global strategies. And so I think you're going to see on the infectious disease side of the house a regeneration of disease. I think you will also see it on rare disease, rare genetic disease, ah. where you have, because of, it's all about you know, gene pools, you can have regions of the world where you have a lot of certain type of rare disease that might not be very present in the US and in Europe, where you might not have people having keen interest in developing a, a drug for, let's say, Saudi, or for Iceland, or for Japan, because the co those communities for hundreds of years have lived very close. So the gene pool has not been you know, mixed as much as it has been in Europe or in the US, if that makes sense. It, that, that has never made financial sense before, right? But now, is it that you can lower the cost or change the clinical trial system or, you know? So the big advantage of mRNA technology is that it's because it's information. Um, as we, sh we showed during COVID, I mean, we were in the clinic in 60 days, as, as we know. Yeah. You know. We designed the vaccine early January, early March, we were in clinical trials. So this platform nature of mRNA is an amazing advantage to be able to go very fast, mm -hmm. but also to be able to use economies of scales of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about mRNA, it, we code every drug we make in four letters, the four letters of life. It's the same letters that are used in plants, in animals, in fishes, in humans, same four letters. And like every software is made of zero and one, every protein of any living species on the planet, including a tree, is made of the same four letters. So between one product and the second product at Moderna, the only thing we change as we make the product is the order of the letters. So the manufacturing process is the same, with the same reactors, the same raw materials, the same teams. So literally in a room, maybe a quarter of the size of this room, in a week we can, in a week we can make, let's say, a COVID vaccine, the week after we can make an RSV vaccine, the week after we can make a rare genetic disease. So think about the economies of scale you get. You get all the f large hundreds of millions of doses of vaccines because you give those to healthy people, so you give a lot of those. Uh, and you have that economies of scale in manufacturing that you can use the next week yeah. to make a rare genetic disease where you make a batch, let's say once per year, or if, even once every four or five years, you'll freeze it. And when you need more product, let's say in Iceland or in Japan, you just make maybe a thousand doses that you fill in the vials, you ship them. And so th that just gives you industrial flexibility of a scale we've never seen before because if you think about it, the pharmaceutical and biotech industry for the last 150 years has been an analog business where every drug is physically different, meaning you need a different factory, a different manufacturing process for every drug because they are different. But in our case, you just change the order of the letters and you have a new drug. Stefan. Thank you. This has been fascinating, and I hope eye-opening to people in the audience. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Please welcome back Semaphore co-founder and CEO, Justin B. Smith. Thank you so much. Well, um, you all... Uh, win the award, because you, uh, you made it through the, uh, the last session of the 2024 uh, Semaphore World Economy Summit. And I really want to start by just thanking all of you for, for your attention, your engagement. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And uh, the, these types of live events are so, so dependent on having a a discerning and intelligent audience. So thank you so much to all of you. I also want to thank our speakers, our moderators, our partner organizations for making this a big success. For the last 17 months, our, our, our news company, Semaphore's team has been on a mission to provide leaders with intelligent, independent, global, and transparent journalism. And uh, at the con conclusion of this second year of this event, I, I think this is perhaps one of the clearest dis distillations of Semaphore's vision, uh, our pedigree as, a, as an organization in terms of the quality of our journalism and our journalists. 
uh, and also our ambitions uh, in the sphere of live journalism because our, our hope is that in five years, you're in the audience again and you'll look back and say, wow, I, I, was, I was there at the very beginning when this summit meeting was just hatched and was just being built by a band of entrepreneurs who cared a lot about news and fact-based dialogue. So, th so I, I invite you to stick with us on this journey. Um, I would like to thank uh, one last time our five founding partners. I always say that quality journalism is expensive and needs the support of, uh, of all sorts of uh, enterprises and partners. In this case, Amazon, Bank of, uh, Bank of America, Boston Consulting Group, Verizon, and the Hyundai Motor Group, um, as well as our presenting sponsor, IBM. Uh, I do want to mention just a few people, um, even though everyone at Semaphore contributed to this, literally our entire company um, took on different roles and, you know, we have people doing registration who are, you know, digital technologists and we all sort of grouped in together, but they're sort of a core leadership team uh, of four people. Our executive editor, Gina Chan, who sort of conceived of and executed the whole program. Our founding editor at large, Steve Clemens, who you may have seen, who, who really did a lot of the, the, the heavy duty moderating. Our head of events, Maggie Sorgel. Our head of audience development, Anna Pizzino. Um, and I want to thank them all for their, for their leadership. Thank you. Thank you. And I, uh, you, you probably know that um, this is uh, the home of the Gallup organization. And we at Semaphore are just invited guests um, to Gallup. Early on in our formation as a company, we were invited to incubate here. And then Gallup became an investor in our company and allows us to use this space so graciously and generously. Um, so to Jim Clifton, John Clifton, Christine Sheehan, a heartfelt thank you for allowing us to, to host this here. So, so in closing, I, I do have one last piece of news to break, which is that Semaphore will announce this evening um, the establishment of a World Economy Summit Fall Edition, which is going to take place later this year, aligned to the October IMF World Bank meetings, which will be held in Washington, D.C. And so we hope, as these, um, we hope for two things as these proceedings conclude. One, that all of you will become regular readers of Semaphore, and you can sign up for our newsletters through the QR code behind in, in, the, in, the, in the Great Hall. And secondly, that you'll join us again in six months, two years, three years, four years, five years, and become part of this community that we're building right now. So thank you all. <laughs>